Preface of From Dictatorship to Democracy, Fourth United States Edition, 2010. Narrated Faster Version. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Dictatorship to Democracy by Jean Sharp. Preface. One of my major concerns for many years has been how people could prevent and destroy dictatorships. This has been nurtured in part because of a belief that human beings should not be dominated and destroyed by such regimes. That belief has been strengthened by readings on the importance of human freedom, on the nature of dictatorships from Aristotle to analysts of totalitarianism, and histories of dictatorships, especially the Nazi and Stalinist systems. Over the years, I have had occasion to get to know people who lived and suffered under Nazi rule, including some who survived concentration camps. In Norway, I met people who had resisted fascist rule and survived, and heard of those who perished. I talked with Jews who had escaped the Nazi clutches, and with persons who had helped to save them. Knowledge of the terror of communist rule in various countries has been learned more from books than personal contacts. The terror of these systems appeared to me to be especially poignant, for these dictatorships were imposed in the name of liberation from oppression and exploitation. In more recent decades, through visits of persons from dictatorially ruled countries, such as Panama, Poland, Chile, Tibet, and Burma, the realities of today's dictatorships become more real. From Tibetans, who had fought against Chinese communist aggression, Russians, who had defeated the August 1991 hardline coup, and Thais, who had non-violently blocked a return to military rule, I had gained often troubling perspectives on the insidious nature of dictatorships. The sense of pathos and outrage against the brutalities, along with admiration of the calm heroism of unbelievably brave men and women, were sometimes strengthened by visits to places where the dangers were still great, and yet defiance by brave people continued. These included Panama under Noriega, Vilnius, Lithuania under continued Soviet repression, Tiananmen Square, Beijing, during both the festive demonstration of freedom and while the first armoured personnel carriers entered that fateful night, and the jungle headquarters of the democratic opposition at Manaplor in liberated Burma. Sometimes I visited the sites of the fallen, as the television tower and the cemetery in Vilnius, the public park in Riga, where people had been gunned down, the centre of Ferrara in northern Italy, where the fascists lined up and shot resistors, and a simple cemetery in Manaplor, filled with bodies of men who had died much too young. It is a sad realisation that every dictatorship leaves such death and destruction in its wake. Out of these concerns and experiences grew a determined hope that prevention of tyranny might be possible, that successful struggles against dictatorships could be waged without mass mutual slaughters, that dictatorships could be destroyed and new ones prevented from rising out of the ashes. I have tried to think carefully about the most effective ways in which dictatorships could be successfully disintegrated with the least possible cost in suffering and lives. In this I have drawn on my studies over many years of dictatorships, resistance movements, revolutions, political thought, governmental systems, and especially realistic non-violent struggle. This publication is the result. I am certain it is far from perfect. But perhaps it offers some guidelines to assist thought and planning to produce movements of liberation that are more powerful and effective than might otherwise be the case. Of necessity and of deliberate choice, the focus of this essay is on the generic problem of how to destroy a dictatorship and to prevent the rise of a new one. I am not competent to produce a detailed analysis and prescription for a particular country. However, it is my hope that this generic analysis may be useful to people in, unfortunately, too many countries who now face the realities of dictatorial rule. They will need to examine the validity of this analysis for their situations and the extent to which its major recommendations are, or can be made to be, applicable for their liberation struggles. Nowhere in this analysis do I assume that defying dictators will be an easy or cost-free endeavour. 
all forms of struggle have complications and costs. Fighting dictators will, of course, bring casualties. It is my hope, however, that this analysis will spur resistance leaders to consider strategies that may increase their effective power while reducing the relative level of casualties. Nor should this analysis be interpreted to mean that when a specific dictatorship is ended, all other problems will also disappear. The fall of one regime does not bring in a utopia. Rather, it opens the way for hard work and long efforts to build more just social, economic and political relationships and the eradication of other forms of injustices and oppression. It is my hope that this brief examination of how a dictatorship can be disintegrated may be found useful wherever people live under domination and desire to be free. Jean Sharp 6 October 1993, Albert Einstein Institution, Boston, Massachusetts End of Preface Recording by Benjamin Gittens Chapter 1 of From Dictatorship to Democracy, 4th United States Edition, 2010, Narrated Faster Version. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Dictatorship to Democracy by Gene Sharp. Chapter 1. Facing Dictatorships Realistically. In recent years, various dictatorships, of both internal and external origin, have collapsed or stumbled when confronted by defiant, mobilized people. Often seen as firmly entrenched and impregnable, some of these dictatorships proved unable to withstand the concerted political, economic, and social defiance of the people. Since 1980, dictatorships have collapsed before the predominantly non-violent defiance of people in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia and Slovenia, Madagascar, Mali, Bolivia and the Philippines. Nonviolent resistance has furthered the movement towards democratization in Nepal, Zambia, South Korea, Chile, Argentina, Haiti, Brazil, Uruguay, Malawi, Thailand, Bulgaria, Hungary, Nigeria and various parts of the former Soviet Union, playing a significant role in the defeat of the August 1991 attempted hardline coup d'etat. In addition, mass political defiance has occurred in China, Burma and Tibet in recent years. Although those struggles have not brought an end to the ruling dictatorships or occupations, they have exposed the brutal nature of those repressive regimes to the world community and have provided the populations with valuable experience with this form of struggle. The collapse of dictatorships in the above-named countries certainly has not erased all other problems in those societies. Poverty, crime, bureaucratic inefficiency and environmental destruction are often the legacy of brutal regimes. However, the downfall of these dictatorships has minimally lifted much of the suffering of the victims of oppression and has opened the way for the rebuilding of these societies with greater political democracy, personal liberties and social justice. Section 1.1 A Continuing Problem there has indeed been a trend towards greater democratization and freedom in the world in the past decades. According to Freedom House, which compiles a yearly international survey of the status of political rights and civil liberties, the number of countries around the world classified as free has grown significantly in recent years. In 1983, there were 54 free countries, 47 partly free countries, and 64 not free countries. In 1993, there were 75 free countries, 73 partly free countries, and 38 not free. In 2003, there was 89 free countries, 55 partly free, and 48 not free. In 2009, 89 free countries, 62 partly free, and 42 not free countries. However, this positive trend is tempered by the large numbers of people still living under conditions of tyranny. As of 2008, 34% of the world's 6.68 billion population 
lived in countries designated as not free, that is, areas with extremely restricted political rights and civil liberties. The 42 countries in the not free category are ruled by a range of military dictatorships, as in Burma, traditional repressive monarchies, as in Saudi Arabia and Bhutan, dominant political parties, as in China and North Korea, foreign occupiers, as in Tibet and Western Sahara, or are in a state of transition. Many countries today are in a state of rapid economic, political and social change. Although the number of free countries has increased in recent years, there is a great risk that many nations, in the face of such rapid fundamental changes, will move in the opposite direction and experience new forms of dictatorship. Military cliques, ambitious individuals, elected officials and doctrinal political parties will repeatedly seek to impose their will. Coup d'etats are and will remain a common occurrence. Basic human and political rights will continue to be denied to vast numbers of peoples. Unfortunately, the past is still with us. The problem of dictatorships is deep. People in many countries have experienced decades or even centuries of oppression, whether of domestic or foreign origin. Frequently, unquestioning submission to authority figures and rulers has been long inculcated. In extreme cases, the social, political, economic, and even religious institutions of the society, outside of state control, have been deliberately weakened, subordinated, or even replaced by new regimented institutions used by the state or ruling party to control the society. The population has often been atomized, turned into a mass of isolated individuals, unable to work together to achieve freedom, to confide in each other, or even to do much of anything at their own initiative. The result is predictable. The population becomes weak, lacks self-confidence, and is incapable of resistance. People are often too frightened to share their hatred of the dictatorship and their hunger for freedom, even with family and friends. People are often too terrified to think seriously of public resistance. In any case, what would be the use? Instead, they face suffering without purpose and a future without hope. Current conditions in today's dictatorships may be much worse than earlier. In the past, some people may have attempted resistance. Short-lived mass protests and demonstrations may have occurred. Perhaps spirits soared temporarily. At other times, individuals and small groups may have conducted brave but impotent gestures, asserting some principle or simply their defiance. However noble the motives, such past acts of resistance have often been insufficient to overcome the people's fear and habit of obedience, a necessary prerequisite to destroy the dictatorship. Sadly, those acts may have brought instead only increased suffering and death, not victories or even hope. Section 1.2 Freedom Through Violence What is to be done in such circumstances? The obvious possibilities seem useless. Constitutional and legal barriers, judicial decisions and public opinion are normally ignored by dictators. Understandably, reacting to the brutalities, torture, disappearances and killings, people often have concluded that only violence can end a dictatorship. Angry victims have sometimes organized to fight the brutal dictators with whatever violent and military capacity they could muster despite the odds being against them. These people have often fought bravely, at great cost in suffering and lives. Their accomplishments have sometimes been remarkable, but they rarely have won freedom. Violent rebellions can trigger brutal repression that frequently leaves the populace more helpless than before. Whatever the merits of the violent option, however, one point is clear. By placing confidence in violent means, one has chosen the very type of struggle with which the oppressors nearly always have superiority. The dictators are equipped to apply violence overwhelmingly. However long or briefly these democrats can continue, eventually the harsh military realities usually become inescapable. The dictators almost always have superiority in military hardware, ammunition, transportation, and the size of military forces. 
despite bravery, the Democrats are, almost always, no match. When conventional military rebellion is recognized as unrealistic, some dissidents then favor guerrilla warfare. However, guerrilla warfare rarely, if ever, benefits the oppressed population or ushers in a democracy. Guerrilla warfare is no obvious solution, particularly given the very strong tendency towards immense casualties among one's own people. The technique is no guarantor against failure, despite supporting theory and strategic analysis and sometimes international backing. Guerrilla struggles often last a very long time. Civilian populations are often displaced by the ruling government with immense human suffering and social dislocation. Even when successful, guerrilla struggles often have significant long-term negative structural consequences. Immediately, the attacked regime becomes more dictatorial as a result of its countermeasures. If the guerrillas should finally succeed, the resulting new regime is often more dictatorial than its predecessor due to the centralizing impact of the expanded military forces and the weakening or destruction of the society's independent groups and institutions during the struggle, bodies that are vital in establishing and maintaining a democratic society. Persons hostile to dictatorships should look for another option. Section 1.3. Coups, Elections, Foreign Saviours. A military coup d'etat against a dictatorship might appear to be relatively one of the easiest and quickest ways to remove a particularly repugnant regime. However, there are very serious problems with that technique. Most importantly, it leaves in place the existing maldistribution of power between the population and the elite in control of the government and its military forces. The removal of particular persons and cliques from the governing positions most likely will merely make it possible for another group to take their place. Theoretically, this group might be milder in its behavior and be opened in limited ways to democratic reforms. However, the opposite is as likely to be the case. After consolidating its position, the new clique may turn out to be more ruthless and more ambitious than the old one. Consequently, the new clique, in which hopes may have been placed, will be able to do whatever it wants without concern for democracy or human rights. That is not an acceptable answer to the problem of dictatorship. Elections are not available under dictatorships as an instrument of significant political change. Some dictatorial regimes, such as those of the former Soviet-dominated Eastern Bloc, went through the motions in order to appear democratic. Those elections, however, were merely rigidly controlled plebiscites to get public endorsement of candidates already hand-picked by the dictators. Dictators under pressure may at times agree to new elections, but then rig them to place civilian puppets in government offices. If opposition candidates have been allowed to run and were actually elected, as occurred in Burma in 1990 and Nigeria in 1993, results may simply be ignored and the victors subjected to intimidation, arrest, or even execution. Dictators are not in the business of allowing elections that could remove them from their thrones. Many people now suffering under a brutal dictatorship, or who have gone into exile to escape its immediate grasp, do not believe that the oppressed can liberate themselves. They expect that their people can only be saved by the actions of others. These people place their confidence in external forces. They believe that only international help can be strong enough to bring down the dictators. The view that the oppressed are unable to act effectively is sometimes accurate for a certain time period. As noted, often oppressed people are unwilling and temporarily unable to struggle because they have no confidence in their ability to face the ruthless dictatorship and no known way to save themselves. It is therefore understandable that many people place their hope for liberation in others. This outside force may be public opinion, the United Nations, a particular country, or international economic and political sanctions. Such a scenario may sound comforting, but there are grave problems with this reliance on an outside saviour. Such confidence may be totally misplaced. Usually no foreign saviours are coming, and if a foreign state does intervene, it probably should not be trusted. A few harsh realities concerning reliance on foreign intervention need to be emphasized here. 
frequently foreign states will tolerate or even positively assist a dictatorship in order to advance their own economic or political interests foreign states also may be willing to sell out an oppressed people instead of keeping pledges to assist their liberation at the cost of another objective some foreign states will act against a dictatorship only to gain their own economic political or military control over the country the foreign states may become actively involved for positive purposes only if and when the internal resistance movement has already begun shaking the dictatorship having thereby focused international attention on the brutal nature of the regime dictatorships usually exist primarily because of the internal power distribution in the home country the population and society are too weak to cause the dictatorship serious problems wealth and power are concentrated in too few hands although dictatorships may benefit from or be somewhat weakened by international actions their continuation is dependent primarily on internal factors international pressures can be very useful however when they are supporting a powerful internal resistance movement then for example international economic boycotts embargoes the breaking of diplomatic relations expulsion from international organizations condemnation by united nations bodies and the like can assist greatly however in the absence of a strong internal resistance movement such action by others are unlikely to happen section one point four facing the hard truth the conclusion is a hard one when one wants to bring down a dictatorship most effectively and with the least cost then one has four immediate tasks one one must strengthen the oppressed population themselves in their determination self-confidence and resistance skills two one must strengthen the independent social groups and institutions of the oppressed people three one must create a powerful internal resistance force and four one must develop a wise grand strategic plan for liberation and implement it skillfully a liberation struggle is a time for self-reliance and internal strengthening of the struggle group as charles stuart parnell called out during the irish rent strike campaign in eighteen seventy nine and eighteen eighty it is no use relying on the government you must only rely upon your own determination help yourselves by standing together strengthen those amongst yourselves who are weak band yourselves together organize yourselves and you must win when you have made this question ripe for settlement then and not till then will it be settled against a strong self-reliant force given wise strategy disciplined and courageous action and genuine strength the dictatorship will eventually crumble minimally however the above four requirements must be fulfilled as the above discussion indicates liberation from dictatorships ultimately depends on the people's ability to liberate themselves the cases of successful political defiance or non-violent struggle for political ends cited above indicate that the means do exist for populations to free themselves but the option has remained undeveloped we will examine this option in detail in the following chapters however we should first look at the issue of negotiations as a means of dismantling dictatorships end of chapter one recording by benjamin gittens chapter two of from dictatorship to democracy fourth united states edition twenty ten narrated faster version this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org from dictatorship to democracy by jean sharp chapter two the dangers of negotiations when faced with the severe problems of confronting a dictatorship as surveyed in chapter one some people may lapse back into passive submission others seeing no prospect of achieving democracy may conclude that they must come to terms with the apparently permanent dictatorship hoping that through conciliation compromise and negotiations they might be able to salvage some positive elements 
and to end the brutalities. On the surface, lacking realistic options, there is appeal in that line of thinking. Serious struggle against brutal dictatorships is not a pleasant prospect. Why is it necessary to go that route? Can't everyone just be reasonable and find ways to talk, to negotiate the way to a gradual end to the dictatorship? Can't the Democrats appeal to the dictator's sense of common humanity and convince them to reduce their domination, bit by bit, and perhaps finally to give away completely to the establishment of a democracy? It is sometimes argued that the truth is not all on one side. Perhaps the Democrats have misunderstood the dictators, who may have acted from good motives in difficult circumstances. Or perhaps some may think the dictators would gladly remove themselves from the difficult situation facing the country, if only given some encouragement and enticements. It may be argued that the dictators could be offered a win-win solution, in which everyone gains something. The risks and pain of further struggle could be unnecessary, it may be argued, if the democratic opposition is only willing to settle the conflict peacefully by negotiations, which may even, perhaps, be assisted by some skilled individuals or even another government. Would that not be preferable to a difficult struggle, even if it is one conducted by nonviolent struggle rather than by military war? Section 2.1 Merits and Limitations of Negotiations Negotiations are a very useful tool in resolving certain types of issues and conflicts and should not be neglected or rejected when they are appropriate. In some situations where no fundamental issues are at stake and therefore a compromise is acceptable, negotiations can be an important means to settle a conflict. A labour strike for higher wages is a good example of the appropriate role of negotiations in a conflict. A negotiated settlement may provide an increase somewhere between the sums originally proposed by each of the contending sides. Labour conflicts with legal trade unions are, however, quite different than the conflicts in which the continued existence of a cruel dictatorship or the establishment of political freedom are at stake. When the issues at stake are fundamental, affecting religious principles, issues of human freedom, or the whole future development of the society, negotiations do not provide a way of reaching a mutually satisfactory solution. On some basic issues, there should be no compromise. Only a shift in power relations in favour of the Democrats can adequately safeguard the basic issues at stake. Such a shift will occur through struggle, not negotiations. This is not to say that negotiations ought never to be used. The point here is that negotiations are not a realistic way to remove a strong dictatorship in the absence of a powerful democratic opposition. Negotiations, of course, may not be an option at all. Firmly entrenched dictators who feel secure in their position may refuse to negotiate with their democratic opponents. Or, when negotiations have been initiated, the democratic negotiators may disappear and never be heard from again. Section 2.2 .2. Negotiated Surrender Individuals and groups who oppose a dictatorship and favour negotiations will often have good motives, especially when a military struggle has continued for years against a brutal dictatorship without final victory. It is understandable that all the people of whatever political persuasion would want peace. Negotiations are especially likely to become an issue among Democrats, where the dictators have clear military superiority, and the destruction and casualties among one's own people are no longer bearable. There will then be a strong temptation to explore any other route that might salvage some of the Democrats' objectives while bringing an end to the cycle of violence and counter-violence. The offer by a dictatorship of peace through negotiations with the democratic opposition is, of course, rather disingenuous. The violence could be ended immediately by the dictators themselves, if only they would stop waging war on their own people. They could, at their own initiative, without any bargaining, restore respect for human dignity and rights, free political prisoners, and torture halt military operations, withdraw from the government, and apologize to the people. When the dictatorship is strong, but an irritating resistance exists, 
the dictators may wish to negotiate the opposition into surrender under the guise of making peace the call to negotiate can sound appealing but grave dangers can be lurking within the negotiating room on the other hand when the opposition is exceptionally strong and the dictatorship is genuinely threatened the dictators may seek negotiations in order to salvage as much of their control or wealth as possible in neither case should the democrats help the dictators achieve their goals democrats should be wary of the traps that may be deliberately built into a negotiation process by the dictators the call for negotiations when basic issues of political liberties are involved may be an effort by the dictators to induce the democrats to surrender peacefully while the violence of the dictatorship continues in those types of conflicts the only proper role of negotiations may occur at the end of a decisive struggle in which the power of the dictators has been effectively destroyed and they seek personal safe passage to an international airport section two point three power and justice in negotiations if this judgment sounds too harsh a commentary on negotiations perhaps some of the romanticism associated with them needs to be moderated clear thinking is required as to how negotiations operate negotiation does not mean that the two sides sit down together on a basis of equality and talk through and resolve the differences that produce the conflict between them two facts must be remembered first in negotiations it is not the relative justice of the conflicting views and objectives that determines the content of a negotiated agreement second the content of a negotiated agreement is largely determined by the power capacity of each side several difficult questions must be considered what can each side do at a later date to gain its objectives if the other side fails to come to an agreement at the negotiating table what can each side do after an agreement is reached if the other side breaks its word and use its available forces to seize its objectives despite the agreement a settlement is not reached in negotiations through an assessment of the rights and wrongs of the issues at stake while those may be much discussed the real results in negotiations come from an assessment of the absolute and relative power situations of the contending groups what can the democrats do to ensure that their minimum claims cannot be denied what can the dictators do to stay in control and neutralize the democrats in other words if an agreement comes it is more likely the result of each side estimating how the power capacities of the two sides compare and then calculating how an open struggle might end attention must also be given to what each side is willing to give up in order to reach agreement in successful negotiations there is compromise a splitting of differences each side gets part of what it wants and gives up part of its objectives in the case of extreme dictatorships what are the pro-democracy forces to give up to the dictators what objectives of the dictators are the pro-democracy forces to accept are the democrats to give to the dictators whether a political party or a military cabal a constitutionally established permanent role in the future government where is the democracy in that even assuming that all goes well in negotiations it is necessary to ask what kind of peace will be the result will life then be better or worse than it would be if the democrats began or continued to struggle section two point four agreeable dictators dictators may have a variety of motives and objectives underlying their domination power position wealth reshaping the society and the like one should remember that none of these will be served if they abandon their control positions in the event of negotiations dictators will try to preserve their goals whatever promises offered by dictators in any negotiated settlement no one should ever forget that the dictators may promise anything to secure submission from their democratic opponents and then brazenly violate those same agreements if the democrats agree to halt resistance in order to gain a reprieve from repression they may be very disappointed 
a halt to resistance rarely brings reduced repression. Once the restraining force of internal and international opposition has been removed, dictators may even make their opposition and violence more brutal than before. The collapse of popular resistance often removes the countervailing force that has limited the control and brutality of the dictatorship. The tyrants can then move ahead against whomever they wish. For the tyrant has the power to inflict only that which we lack the strength to resist, wrote Krishnalal Sridharani. Resistance, not negotiations, is essential for change in conflicts where fundamental issues are at stake. In nearly all cases, resistance must continue to drive dictators out of power. Success is most often determined not by negotiating a settlement, but through the wise use of the most appropriate and powerful means of resistance available. It is our contention, to be explored later in more detail, that political defiance, or non-violent struggle, is the most powerful means available to those struggling for freedom. Section 2.5 What kind of peace? If dictators and democrats are to talk about peace at all, extremely clear thinking is needed because of the dangers involved. Not everyone who uses the word peace wants peace with freedom and justice. Submission to cruel oppression and passive acquiescence to ruthless dictators who have perpetrated atrocities on hundreds of thousands of people is no real peace. Hitler often called for peace, by which he meant submission to his will. A dictator's peace is often no more than the peace of the prisoner or of the grave. There are other dangers. Well-intended negotiators sometimes confuse the objectives of the negotiations and the negotiation process itself. Further, democratic negotiators or foreign negotiation specialists accepted to assist in the negotiations may in a single stroke provide the dictators with the domestic and international legitimacy that they had been previously denied because of their seizure of the state, human rights violations and brutalities. Without that desperately needed legitimacy, the dictators cannot continue to rule indefinitely. Exponents of peace should not provide them legitimacy. Section 2.6 Reasons for Hope As stated earlier, opposition leaders may feel forced to pursue negotiations out of the sense of hopelessness of the democratic struggle. However, that sense of powerlessness can be changed. Dictatorships are not permanent. People living under dictatorships need not remain weak, and dictators need not be allowed to remain powerful indefinitely. Aristotle noted long ago, oligarchy and tyranny are shorter lived than any other constitution. All round, tyrannies have not lasted long. Modern dictatorships are also vulnerable. Their weaknesses can be aggravated and the dictator's power can be disintegrated. In chapter 4, we will examine these weaknesses in more detail. Recent history shows the vulnerability of dictatorships and reveals that they can crumble in a relatively short time span, whereas 10 years, 1980 to 1990, were required to bring down the communist dictatorship in Poland. In East Germany and Czechoslovakia in 1989, it occurred within weeks. In El Salvador and Guatemala in 1944, the struggles against the entrenched brutal military dictators required approximately two weeks each. The militarily powerful regime of the Shah in Iran was undermined in a few months. The Marcos dictatorship in the Philippines fell before people power within weeks in 1986. The United States government quickly abandoned President Marcos when the strength of the opposition became apparent. The attempted hardline coup in the Soviet Union in August 1991 was blocked in days by political defiance. Thereafter, many of its long dominated constituent nations in only days, weeks and months regained their independence. The old preconception 
that violent means always work quickly, and non-violent means always require vast time, is clearly not valid. Although much time may be required for changes in the underlying situation in society, the actual fight against a dictatorship sometimes occurs relatively quickly by non-violent struggle. Negotiations are not the only alternative to a continuing war of annihilation on the one hand and capitulation on the other. The examples just cited, as well as those listed in chapter 1, illustrate that another option exists for those who want both peace and freedom, political defiance. End of chapter 2 Recording by Benjamin Giddens Chapter 3 of From Dictatorship to Democracy, 4th United States Edition, 2010, Narrated Faster Version. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Dictatorship to Democracy by Gene Sharp. Chapter 3 Whence Comes the Power? Achieving a society with both freedom and peace is, of course, no simple task. It will require great strategic skill, organization, and planning. Above all, it will require power. Democrats cannot hope to bring down a dictatorship and establish political freedom without the ability to apply their own power effectively. But how is this possible? What kind of power can the democratic opposition mobilize that will be sufficient to destroy the dictatorship and its vast military and police networks? The answers lie in an oft-ignored understanding of political power. Learning this insight is not really so difficult a task. Some basic truths are quite simple. Section 3.1 The Monkey Master Fable a 14th century Chinese parable by Lu Ji, for example, outlines this neglected understanding of political power quite well. In the feudal state of Chu, an old man survived by keeping monkeys in his service. The people of Chu called him Ju Gong, monkey master. Each morning the old man would assemble the monkeys in his courtyard and order the eldest one to lead the others to the mountain to gather fruits from bushes and trees. It was the rule that each monkey had to give one-tenth of his collection to the old man. Those who failed to do so would be ruthlessly flogged. All the monkeys suffered bitterly, but dared not complain. One day a small monkey asked the other monkeys, Did the old man plant all the fruit trees and bushes? The others said, No, they grew naturally. The small monkey further asked, Can't we take the fruits without the old man's permission? The others replied, yes, we all can. The small monkey continued, then why should we depend on the old man? Why must we all serve him? Before the small monkey was able to finish his statement, all the monkeys suddenly become enlightened and awakened. On the same night, watching that the old man had fallen asleep, the monkeys tore down all the barricades at the stockade in which they were confined and destroyed the stockade entirely. They also took the fruits the old man had in storage, brought all with them to the woods, and never returned. The old man finally died of starvation. Yu Li Zi says, Some men in the world rule their people by tricks, and not by righteous principles. Aren't they just like the monkey master? They are not aware of their muddle-headedness. As soon as their people become enlightened, their tricks no longer work. Section 3.2 Necessary Sources of Political Power The principle is simple. Dictators require the assistance of the people they rule, without which they cannot secure or maintain the sources of political power. These sources of political power include authority, the belief among the people that the regime is legitimate and that they have a moral duty to obey it, human resources, the number and importance of the persons and groups which are obeying, cooperating, or providing assistance to the rulers. Skills and knowledge, needed by the regime to perform specific actions and 
supplied by the cooperating persons and groups. Intangible factors, psychological and ideological factors that may induce people to obey and assist the rulers. Material resources, the degree to which the rulers control or have access to property, natural resources, financial resources, the economic systems, and means of communication and transportation. And sanctions, punishments threatened or applied against the disobedient and non-cooperative to ensure the submission and cooperation that are needed for the regime to exist and carry out its policies. All of these sources, however, depend on acceptance of the regime, on the submission and obedience of the population, and on the cooperation of innumerable people and the many institutions of the society. These are not guaranteed. Full cooperation, obedience and support will increase the availability of the needed sources of power and consequently expand the power capacity of any government. On the other hand, withdrawal of popular and institutional cooperation with aggressors and dictators diminishes and may sever the availability of the sources of power on which all rulers depend. Without availability of those sources, the ruler's power weakens and finally dissolves. Naturally, dictators are sensitive to actions and ideas that threaten their capacity to do as they like. Dictators are therefore likely to threaten and punish those who disobey, strike, or fail to cooperate. However, that is not the end of the story. Repression, even brutalities, do not always produce a resumption of the necessary degree of submission and cooperation for the regime to function. If, despite repression, the sources of power can be restricted or severed for enough time, the initial results may be uncertainty and confusion within the dictatorship. That is likely to be followed by a clear weakening of the power of the dictatorship. Over time, the withholding of the sources of power can produce the paralysis and impotence of the regime, and in severe cases, its disintegration. The dictator's power will die, slowly or rapidly, from political starvation. The degree of liberty or tyranny in any government is, it follows, in a large degree, a reflection of the relative determination of the subjects to be free and their willingness and ability to resist efforts to enslave them. Contrary to popular opinion, even totalitarian dictatorships are dependent on the population and the societies they rule. As the political scientist Carl W. Dutch noted in 1953, totalitarian power is strong only if it does not have to be used too often. If totalitarian power must be used at all times against the entire population, it is unlikely to remain powerful for long. Since totalitarian regimes require more power for dealing with their subjects than do other types of government, such regimes stand in greater need of widespread and dependable compliance habits among their people. More than that, they have to be able to count on the active support of at least significant parts of the population in case of need. The English 19th century legal theorist John Austin described the situation of a dictatorship confronting a disaffected people. Austin argued that if most of the population were determined to destroy the government and were willing to endure repression to do so, then the might of the government, including those who supported it, could not preserve the hated government even if it received foreign assistance. The defiant people could not be forced back into permanent obedience and subjection, Austin concluded. Niccolò Machiavelli had much earlier argued that the prince, who has the public as a whole for his enemy, can never make himself secure, and the greater his cruelty, the weaker does his regime become. The practical political application of these insights was demonstrated by the heroic Norwegian resistors against the Nazi occupation, and as cited in Chapter 1, by the brave Poles, Germans, Czechs, Slovaks, and many others who resisted communist aggression and dictatorship, and finally helped produce the collapse of communist rule in Europe. 
This, of course, is no new phenomenon. Cases of non-violence resistance go back at least to 494 BC, when plebeians withdrew cooperation from their Roman patrician masters. Non-violent struggle has been employed at various times by peoples throughout Asia, Africa, the Americas, Australasia, and the Pacific Islands, as well as Europe. Three of the most important factors in determining to what degree a government's power will be controlled or uncontrolled, therefore, are 1. The relative desire of the populace to impose limits on the government's power. 2. The relative strength of the subjects, independent organizations and institutions to withdraw collectively the sources of power. And 3 the population's relative ability to withhold their consent and assistance. Section 3.3 .3. Centres of Democratic Power One characteristic of a democratic society is that there exist independent of the state a multitude of non-governmental groups and institutions. These include, for example, families, religious organizations, cultural associations, sports clubs, economic institutions, trade unions, student associations, political parties, villages, neighborhood associations, gardening clubs, human right organizations, musical groups, literary societies, and others. These bodies are important in serving their own objectives and also in helping to meet social needs. Additionally, these bodies have great political significance. They provide group and institutional bases by which people can exert influence over the direction of their society and resist other groups or the government when they are seen to impinge unjustly on their interests, activities, or purposes. Isolated individuals, not members of such groups, usually are unable to make a significant impact on the rest of society, much less a government and certainly not a dictatorship. Consequently, if the autonomy and freedom of such bodies can be taken away by the dictators, the population will be relatively helpless. Also, if these institutions can themselves be dictatorially controlled by the central regime or replaced by new controlled ones, they can be used to dominate both the individual members and also those areas of the society. However, if the autonomy and freedom of these independent civil institutions, outside of government control, can be maintained or regained, they are highly important for the application of political defiance. The common feature of the cited examples in which dictatorships have been disintegrated or weakened has been the courageous mass application of political defiance by the population and its institutions. As stated, these centers of power provide the institutional bases from which the population can exert pressure or can resist dictatorial controls. In the future, they will be part of the indispensable structural base for a free society. Their continued independence and growth, therefore, is often a prerequisite for the success of the liberation struggle. If the dictatorship has been largely successful in destroying or controlling the society's independent bodies, it will be important for the resistors to create new independent social groups and institutions, or to reassert democratic control over surviving or partially controlled bodies. During the Hungarian Revolution of 1956 to 1957, a multitude of direct democracy councils emerged even joining together to establish, for some weeks, a whole federated system of institutions and governance. In Poland, during the late 1980s, workers maintained illegal solidarity unions and, in some cases, took over control of the official communist-dominated trade unions. Such institutional developments can have very important political consequences. Of course, None of this means that weakening and destroying dictatorships is easy, nor that every attempt will succeed. It certainly does not mean that the struggle will be free of casualties, for those still serving the dictators are likely to fight back in an effort to force the populace to resume cooperation and obedience. The above insight into power does mean, however, 
that the deliberate disintegration of dictatorships is possible. Dictatorships in particular have specific characteristics that render them highly vulnerable to skillfully implemented political defiance. Let us examine these characteristics in more detail. End of chapter 3 Recording by Benjamin Gittens Chapter 4 of From Dictatorship to Democracy, 4th United States Edition, 2010 Narrated Faster Version This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org from Dictatorship to Democracy, 4th United States Edition, by Jane Sharp. Chapter 4. Dictatorships Have Weaknesses. Dictatorships often appear invulnerable. Intelligence agencies, police, military forces, prisons, concentration camps, and execution squads are controlled by a powerful few. A country's finances, natural resources, and production capacities are often arbitrarily plundered by dictators and used to support the dictator's will. In comparison, democratic opposition forces often appear extremely weak, ineffective, and powerless. That perception of invulnerability against powerlessness makes effective opposition unlikely. That is not the whole story, however. Section 4.1 Identifying the Achilles' Heel a myth from classical Greece illustrates well the vulnerability of the supposedly invulnerable. Against the warrior, Achilles, no blow would injure and no sword would penetrate his skin. When still a baby, Achilles' mother had supposedly dipped him into the waters of the magical river Styx, resulting in the protection of his body from all dangers. There was, however, a problem. Since the baby was held by his heel, so that he would not be washed away, the magical water had not covered that small part of his body. When Achilles was a grown man, he appeared to all to be invulnerable to the enemy's weapons. However, in the battle against Troy, instructed by one who knew the weakness, an enemy soldier aimed his arrow at Achilles' unprotected heel, the one spot where he could be injured. The strike proved fatal. Still today, the phrase Achilles' heel refers to the vulnerable part of a person, a plan, or an institution at which, if attacked, there is no protection. The same principle applies to ruthless dictatorships. They, too, can be conquered, but most quickly and with least cost if their weaknesses can be identified and the attack concentrated on them. Section 4.2 Weaknesses of dictatorships. Among the weaknesses of dictatorships are the following. 1. The cooperation of a multitude of people, groups, and institutions needed to operate the system may be restricted or withdrawn. 2. The requirements and effect of the regime's past policies will somewhat limit its present ability to adapt and implement conflicting policies. 3. The system may become routine in its operation, less able to adjust quickly to new situations. 4. Personnel and resources already allocated for existing tasks will not be easily available for new needs. 5. Subordinates fearful of displeasing their superiors may not report accurate or complete information needed by the dictators to make decisions. 6. The ideology may erode and myths and symbols of the system may become unstable. 7. If a strong ideology is present that influences one's view of reality, firm adherence to it may cause inattention to actual conditions and needs. 8. Deteriorating efficiency and competency of the bureaucracy, or excessive controls and regulations, may make the system's policies and operation ineffective. 9. Internal institutional conflicts and personal rivalries and hostilities may harm, and even disrupt, the operation of the dictatorship. 10. Intellectuals and students may become restless in response to conditions, restrictions, 
doctrinalism and repression. 11. The general public may over time become apathetic, sceptical, and even hostile to the regime. 12. Regional, class, cultural, or national differences may become acute. 13. The power hierarchy of the dictatorship is always unstable to some degree, and at times extremely so. Individuals do not only remain in the same position in the ranking, but may rise or fall to other ranks, or be removed entirely and replaced by new persons. 14. Sections of the police or military forces may act to achieve their own objectives, even against the will of established dictators, including by coup d'etat. 15. If the dictatorship is new, time is required for it to become well established. 16. With so many decisions made by so few people in the dictatorship, mistakes of judgment, policy and action are likely to occur. 17. If the regime seeks to avoid these dangers and decentralizes control and decision making, its control over the central levers of power may be further eroded. Section 4.3 Attacking Weaknesses of Dictatorships With knowledge of such inherent weaknesses, the democratic opposition can seek to aggravate these Achilles heels deliberately in order to alter the system drastically or to disintegrate it. The conclusion is then clear. Despite the appearances of strength, all dictatorships have weaknesses, internal inefficiencies, personal rivalries, institutional inefficiencies, and conflicts between organizations and departments. These weaknesses, over time, tend to make the regime less effective and more vulnerable to changing conditions and deliberate resistance. Not everything the regime sets out to accomplish will get completed. At times, for example, even Hitler's direct orders were never implemented because those beneath him in the hierarchy refused to carry them out. The dictatorial regime may at times even fall apart quickly, as we have already observed. This does not mean dictatorships can be destroyed without risks and casualties. Every possible course of action for liberation will involve risks and potential suffering, and will take time to operate. And of course, no means of action can ensure rapid success in every situation. However, types of struggle that target the dictatorship's identifiable weaknesses have greater chance of success than those that seek to fight the dictatorship where it is clearly strongest. The question is, how this struggle is to be waged? End of chapter 4. Recording by Benjamin Gittens. Chapter 5 of From Dictatorship to Democracy, 4th United States Edition, 2010. Narrated faster version. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Dictatorship to Democracy by Jean Sharp Chapter 5 Exercising Power In Chapter 1, we noted that military resistance against dictatorships does not strike them where they are weakest, but rather where they are strongest. By choosing to compete in the areas of military forces, supplies of ammunition, weapons, technology, and the like, resistance movements tend to put themselves at a distinct disadvantage. Dictatorships will almost always be able to muster superior resources in these areas. The dangers of relying on foreign powers for salvation were also outlined. In Chapter 2, we examined the problems of relying on negotiations as a means to remove dictatorships. What means are then available that will offer the democratic resistance distinct advantages and will tend to aggravate the identified weaknesses of dictatorships? What technique of action will capitalize on the theory of political power discussed in Chapter 3? The alternative of choice is political defiance. Political defiance has the following characteristics. It does not accept 
that the outcome will be decided by the means of fighting chosen by the dictatorship. It is difficult for the regime to combat. It can uniquely aggravate weaknesses of the dictatorship and can sever its sources of power. It can in action be widely dispersed, but can also be concentrated on a specific objective. It leads to errors of judgment and action by the dictators. It can effectively utilize the population as a whole and the societies, groups and institutions in the struggle to end the brutal domination of the few. It helps to spread the distribution of effective power in the society, making the establishment and maintenance of a democratic society more possible. Section 5.1 The Workings of Nonviolent Struggle Like military capabilities, political defiance can be employed for a variety of purposes, ranging from efforts to influence the opponents to take different actions, to create conditions for a peaceful resolution of conflict, or to disintegrate the opponent's regime. However, political defiance operates in quite different ways from violence. Although both techniques are means to wage struggle, they do so with very different means and with different consequences. The ways and results of violent conflict are well known. Physical weapons are used to intimidate, injure, kill and destroy. Nonviolent struggle is a much more complex and varied means of struggle than is violence. Instead, the struggle is fought by psychological, social, economic and political weapons applied by the population and the institutions of the society. These have been known under various names of protests, strikes, non-cooperation, boycotts, disaffection and people power. As noted earlier, all governments can rule only as long as they receive replenishment of the needed sources of their power from the cooperation, submission and obedience of the population and the institutions of the society. Political defiance, unlike violence, is uniquely suited to severing those sources of power. Section 5.2 Nonviolent Weapons and Discipline the common error of past improvised political defiance campaigns is the reliance on only one or two methods, such as strikes and mass demonstrations. In fact, a multitude of methods exist that allow resistance strategists to concentrate and disperse resistance as required. About 200 specific methods of nonviolent action have been identified and there are certainly scores more. These methods are classified under three broad categories, protest and persuasion, non-cooperation, and intervention. Methods of non-violent protest and persuasion are largely symbolic demonstrations, including parades, marches, and vigils, of which there are 54 methods. Non-cooperation is divided into three subcategories. A. Social non-cooperation, 16 methods. B. Economic non-cooperation, including boycotts, 26 methods, and strikes, 23 methods. And C. Political non-cooperation, 38 methods. Nonviolent intervention by psychological, physical, social, economic, or political means, such as the fast, nonviolent occupation, and parallel governments, 41 methods, is the final group. A list of 198 of these methods is included as the appendix to this publication. The use of a considerable number of these methods, carefully chosen, applied persistently and on a large scale, wielded in the context of a wise strategy and appropriate tactics by trained civilians, is likely to cause any illegitimate regime severe problems. This applies to all dictatorships. In contrast to military means, the methods of nonviolent struggle can be focused directly on the issues at stake. For example, since the issue of dictatorship is primarily political, then political forms of nonviolent struggle would be crucial. These would include denial of legitimacy to the dictators and non cooperation with their regime. Non cooperation would also be applied against specific policies. 
at times stalling and procrastination may be quietly and even secretly practised while at other times open disobedience and defiant public demonstrations and strikes may be visible to all on the other hand if the dictatorship is vulnerable to economic pressures or if many of the popular grievances against it are economic then economic action such as boycotts or strikes may be appropriate resistance methods the dictator's efforts to exploit the economic system might be met with limited general strikes slowdowns and refusal of assistance by or disappearance of indispensable experts selective use of various types of strikes may be conducted at key points in manufacturing in transport in the supply of raw materials and in the distribution of products some methods of non-violent struggle require people to perform acts unrelated to their normal lives such as distributing leaflets operating an underground press going on hunger strike or sitting down in the streets these methods may be difficult for some people to undertake except in very extreme situations other methods of non-violent struggle instead require people to continue approximately their normal lives though in somewhat different ways for example people may report for work instead of striking but then deliberately work more slowly or inefficiently than usual mistakes may be consciously made more frequently one may become sick and unable to work at certain times or one may simply refuse to work one might go to religious services when the act expresses not only religious but also political convictions one may act to protect children from the attacker's propaganda by education at home or in legal classes one might refuse to join certain recommended or required organizations that one would have not joined freely in earlier times the similarity of such types of action to people's usual activities and the limited degree of departure from their normal lives may make participation in the national liberation struggle much easier for many people since non-violent struggle and violence operate in fundamentally different ways even limited resistance violence during a political defiance campaign will be counterproductive for it will shift the struggle to one in which the dictators have an overwhelming advantage military warfare non-violent discipline is a key to success and must be maintained despite provocations and brutalities by the dictators and their agents the maintenance of non-violent discipline against violent opponents facilitates the workings of the four mechanisms of change in non-violent struggle discussed below non-violent discipline is also extremely important in the process of political jiu-jitsu in this process the stark brutality of the regime against the clearly non-violent actionists politically rebounds against the dictator's position causing dissension in their own ranks as well as fomenting support for the resistors among the general population the regime's usual supporters and third parties in some cases however limited violence against the dictatorship may be inevitable frustration and hatred of the regime may explode into violence or certain groups may be unwilling to abandon violent means even though they recognize the important role of non-violent struggle in these cases political defiance does not need to be abandoned however it will be necessary to separate the violent action as far as possible from the non-violent action this should be done in terms of geography population groups timing and issues otherwise the violence could have a disastrous effect on the potentially much more powerful and successful use of political defiance the historical record indicates that while casualties in dead and wounded must be expected in political defiance they will be far fewer than the casualties in military warfare furthermore this type of struggle does not contribute to the endless cycle of killing and brutality non-violent struggle both requires and tends to produce a loss or greater control of fear of the government and its violent repression that abandonment or control of fear is a key element in destroying the power of the dictators over the general population
Section 5.3 Openness, Secrecy, and High Standards Secrecy, deception, and underground conspiracy pose very difficult problems for a movement using non-violent action. It is often impossible to keep the political police and intelligence agents from learning about intentions and plans. From the perspective of the movement, secrecy is not only rooted in fear, but contributes to fear, which dampens the spirit of resistance and reduces the number of people who can participate in a given action. It also can contribute to suspicions and accusations, often unjustified, within the movement concerning who is an informer or agent for the opponents. Secrecy may also affect the ability of a movement to remain non-violent. In contrast, openness regarding intentions and plans will not only have the opposite effects, but will contribute to an image that the resistance movement is in fact extremely powerful. The problem is of course more complex than this suggests, and there are significant aspects of resistance activities that may require secrecy. A well-informed assessment will be required by those knowledgeable about both the dynamics of nonviolent struggle and also the dictatorship's means of surveillance in the specific situation. The editing, printing and distribution of underground publications, the use of illegal radio broadcasts from within the country, and the gathering of intelligence about the operations of the dictatorship are among the special limited types of activities where a high degree of secrecy will be required. The maintenance of high standards of behavior and nonviolent action is necessary at all stages of the conflict. Such factors as fearlessness and maintaining nonviolent discipline are always required. It is important to remember that large numbers of people may frequently be necessary to effect particular changes. However, such numbers can be obtained as reliable participants only by maintaining the high standards of the movement. Section 5.4 Shifting Power Relationships Strategists need to remember that the conflict in which political defiance is applied is a constantly changing field of struggle with continuing interplay of moves and countermoves. Nothing is static. Power relationships, both absolute and relative, are subject to constant and rapid changes. This is made possible by the resistors continuing their non-violent persistence despite repression. The variations in the respective power of the contending sides in this type of conflict situation are likely to be more extreme than in violent conflicts, to take place more quickly and to have more diverse and politically significant consequences. Due to these variations, specific actions by the resistors are likely to have consequences far beyond the particular time and place in which they occur. These effects will rebound to strengthen or weaken one group or other. In addition, the non-violent group may, by its actions, exert influence over the increase or decrease in the relative strength of the opponent group to a great extent. For example, disciplined, courageous, non-violent resistance in face of the dictator's brutalities may induce unease, disaffection, unreliability, and in extreme situations even mutiny among the dictator's own soldiers and population. This resistance may also result in increased international condemnation of the dictatorship. In addition, skillful, disciplined and persistent use of political defiance may result in more and more participation in the resistance by people who normally would give their tacit support to the dictators or generally remain neutral in the conflict. Section 5.5 Four Mechanisms of Change Nonviolent struggle produces change in four ways. The first mechanism is the least likely, though it has occurred. When members of the opponent group are emotionally moved by the suffering of repression imposed on courageous nonviolent resistors, or are rationally persuaded that the resistors' cause is just, they may come to accept the resistors' aims. This mechanism is called conversion. Though cases of conversion in non-violent action do sometimes happen, they are rare, and in most conflicts this 
does not occur at all or at least not on a significant scale far more often non-violent struggle operates by changing the conflict situation and the society so the opponents simply cannot do as they like it is this change that produces the other three mechanisms accommodation non-violent coercion and disintegration which of these occurs depends on the degree to which the relative and absolute power relations are shifted in favour of the democrats if the issues are not fundamental ones the demands of the opposition in a limited campaign are not considered threatening and the contest of forces has altered the power or relationship to some degree the immediate conflict may be ended by reaching an agreement a splitting of differences or compromise this mechanism is called accommodation many strikes are settled in this manner for example with both sides attaining some of their objectives but neither achieving all it wanted a government may perceive such a settlement to have some positive benefits such as diffusing tension creating an impression of fairness or polishing the international image of the regime it is important therefore that great care be exercised in selecting the issues on which a settlement by accommodation is acceptable a struggle to bring down a dictatorship is not one of these non-violent struggle can be much more powerful than indicated by the mechanisms of conversion or accommodation mass non-cooperation and defiance can so change social and political situations especially power relationships that the dictator's ability to control the economic social and political processes of government and the society is in fact taken away the opponent's military forces may become so unreliable that they no longer simply obey orders to repress resistors although the opponent's leaders remain in their positions and adhere to their original goals their ability to act effectively has been taken away from them that is called non-violent coercion in some extreme situations the conditions producing non-violent coercion are carried still further the opponent's leadership in fact loses all ability to act and their own structure of power collapses the resistor's self-direction non-cooperation and defiance becomes so complete that the opponents now lack even a semblance of control over them the opponent's bureaucracy refuses to obey its own leadership the opponent's troops and police mutiny the opponent's usual supporters or population repudiate their former leadership denying that they have any right to rule at all hence their former assistance and obedience falls away the fourth mechanism of change disintegration of the opponent's systems is so complete that they do not even have sufficient power to surrender the regime simply falls to pieces in planning liberation strategies these four mechanisms should be kept in mind they sometimes operate essentially by chance however the selection of one or more of these as the intended mechanism of change in a conflict will make it possible to formulate specific and mutually reinforcing strategies which mechanism or mechanisms to select will depend on numerous factors including the absolute and relative power of the contending groups and the attitudes and objectives of the non-violent struggle group section five point six democratizing effects of political defiance in contrast to the centralizing effects of violent sanctions use of the technique of non-violent struggle contributes to democratizing the political society in several ways one part of the democratizing effect is negative that is in contrast to military means this technique does not provide a means of repression under command of a ruling elite which can be turned against the population to establish or maintain a dictatorship leaders of political defiance movement can exert influence and apply pressures on their followers but they cannot imprison or execute them when they dissent or choose other leaders another part of the democratizing effect is positive that is non-violent struggle provides the population with means of resistance that can be used to achieve and defend their liberties against existing or would-be dictators 
Below are several of the positive democratizing effects nonviolent struggle may have. Experience in applying nonviolent struggle may result in the population being more self confident in challenging the regime's threats and capacity for violent repression. Nonviolent struggle provides the means of non cooperation and defiance by which the population can resist undemocratic controls over them by any dictatorial group. Nonviolent struggle can be used to assert the practice of democratic freedoms, such as free speech, free press, independent organizations, and free assembly, in face of repressive controls. Nonviolent struggle contributes strongly to the survival, rebirth, and strengthening of the independent groups and institutions of the society, as previously discussed. These are important for democracy because of their capacity to mobilize the power capacity of the population and to impose limits on the effective power of any would be dictators. Nonviolent struggle provides means by which the population can wield power against repressive police and military action by a dictatorial government. And nonviolent struggle provides methods by which the population and the independent institutions can, in the interest of democracy, restrict or sever the sources of power for the ruling elite, thereby threatening its capacity to continue its domination. Section 5.6 Complexity of Nonviolent Struggle As we have seen from this discussion, nonviolent struggle is a complex technique of social action, involving a multitude of methods, a range of mechanisms of change, and specific behavioral requirements. To be effective, especially against a dictatorship, political defiance requires careful planning and preparation. Prospective participants will need to understand what is required of them. Resources will need to have been made available, and strategists will need to have analyzed how nonviolent struggle can be most effectively applied. We now turn our attention to this latter crucial element, the need for strategic planning. End of chapter 5. Recording by Benjamin Giddens. Chapter 6 of From Dictatorship to Democracy, 4th United States Edition, 2010. Narrated faster version. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Dictatorship to Democracy by Jean Sharp Chapter 6 The Need for Strategic Planning Political defiance campaigns against dictatorships may begin in a variety of ways. In the past, these struggles have almost always been unplanned and essentially accidental. Specific grievances that have triggered past initial actions have varied widely, but often included new brutalities, the arrest or killing of a highly regarded person, a new repressive policy or order, food shortages, disrespect towards religious beliefs, or an anniversary of an important related event. Sometimes a particular act by the dictatorship has so enraged the populace that they have launched into action without having any idea how the rising might end. At other times a courageous individual or a small group may have taken action which aroused support. A specific grievance may be recognized by others as similar to wrongs they had experienced, and they too may thus join the struggle. Sometimes a specific call for resistance from a small group or individual may meet an unexpectedly large response. While spontaneity has some positive qualities, it has often had disadvantages. Frequently, the democratic resistors have not anticipated the brutalities of the dictatorship, so that they suffered gravely, and the resistance has collapsed. At times the lack of planning by democrats has left crucial decisions to chance, with disastrous results. Even when the oppressive system was brought down, lack of planning on how to handle the transition to a democratic system has contributed to the emergence of a new dictatorship. Section 6.1 Realistic Planning in the future, unplanned popular action will undoubtedly play significant roles in risings against dictatorships. However, 
it is now possible to calculate the most effective ways to bring down a dictatorship to assess when the political situation and popular mood are ripe and to choose how to initiate a campaign very careful thought based on a realistic assessment of the situation and the capabilities of the populace is required in order to select effective ways to achieve freedom under such circumstances if one wishes to accomplish something it is wise to plan how to do it the more important the goal or the graver the consequences of failure the more important planning becomes strategic planning increases the likelihood that all available resources will be mobilized and employed most effectively this is especially true for a democratic movement which has limited material resources and whose supporters will be in danger that is trying to bring down a powerful dictatorship in contrast the dictatorship usually will have access to vast material resources organizational strength and ability to perpetrate brutalities to plan a strategy here means to calculate a course of action that will make it more likely to get from the present to the desired future situation in terms of this discussion it means from a dictatorship to a future democratic system a plan to achieve that objective will usually consist of a phased series of campaigns and other organized activities designed to strengthen the oppressed population and society and to weaken the dictatorship note here that the objective is not simply to destroy the current dictatorship but to emplace a democratic system a grand strategy that limits its objective to merely destroying the incumbent dictatorship runs a great risk of producing another tyrant section six point two hurdles to planning some exponents of freedom in various parts of the world do not bring their full capacities to bear on the problem of how to achieve liberation only rarely do these advocates fully recognize the extreme importance of careful strategic planning before they act consequently this is almost never done why is it that the people who have the vision of bringing political freedom to their people should so rarely prepare a comprehensive strategic plan to achieve that goal unfortunately often most people in democratic opposition groups do not understand the need for strategic planning or are not accustomed or trained to think strategically this is a difficult task constantly harassed by the dictatorship and overwhelmed by immediate responsibilities resistance leaders often do not have the safety or time to develop strategic thinking skills instead it is a common pattern simply to react to the initiatives of the dictatorship the opposition is then always on the defensive seeking to maintain limited liberties or bastions of freedom at best slowing the advance of the dictatorial controls or causing certain problems for the regime's new policies some individuals and groups of course may not see the need for broad long-term planning of a liberation movement instead they may naively think that if they simply espouse their goal strongly firmly and long enough it will somehow come to pass others assume that if they simply live and witness according to their principles and ideals in face of difficulties they are doing all they can to implement them the espousal of humane goals and loyalty to ideals are admirable but are grossly inadequate to end a dictatorship and to achieve freedom other opponents of dictatorship may naively think that if only they use enough violence freedom will come but as noted earlier violence is no guarantor of success instead of liberation it can lead to defeat massive tragedy or both in most situations the dictatorship is best equipped for violent struggle and the military realities rarely if ever favor the democrats there are also activists who base their actions on what they feel they should do these approaches are however not only egocentric but they offer no guidance for developing a grand strategy of liberation action based on a bright idea that someone has had is also limited what is needed instead is action based on careful calculation of the next steps required to topple the dictatorship 
without strategic analysis resistance leaders will often not know what that next step should be for they have not thought carefully about the successive specific steps required to achieve victory creativity and bright ideas are very important but they need to be utilized in order to advance the strategic situation of the democratic forces acutely aware of the multitude of actions that could be taken against the dictatorship and unable to determine where to begin some people counsel do everything simultaneously that might be helpful but of course is impossible especially for relatively weak movements furthermore such an approach provides no guidance on where to begin on where to concentrate efforts and how to use often limited resources other persons and groups may see the need for some planning but are only able to think about it on a short-term or tactical basis they may not see that longer-term planning is necessary or possible they may at times be unable to think and analyze in strategic terms allowing themselves to be repeatedly distracted by relatively small issues often responding to the opponent's actions rather than seizing the initiative for the democratic resistance devoting so much energy to short-term activities these leaders often fail to explore several alternative courses of action which could guide the overall efforts so that the goal is constantly approached it is also just possible that some democratic movements do not plan a comprehensive strategy to bring down the dictatorship concentrating instead only on immediate issues for another reason inside themselves they do not really believe that the dictatorship can be ended by their own efforts therefore planning how to do so is considered to be a romantic waste of time or an exercise in futility people struggling for freedom against established brutal dictatorships are often confronted by such immense military and police power that it appears that the dictators can accomplish whatever they will lacking real hope these people will nevertheless defy the dictatorships for reasons of integrity and perhaps history though they will never admit it perhaps never consciously recognize it their actions appear to themselves as hopeless hence for them long-term comprehensive strategic planning has no merit the result of such failures to plan strategically is often drastic one's strength is dissipated one's actions are ineffective energy is wasted on minor issues advantages are not utilized and sacrifices are for naught if democrats do not plan strategically they are likely to fail to achieve their objectives a poorly planned odd mixture of activities will not move a major resistance effort forward instead it will more likely allow the dictatorship to increase its controls and power unfortunately because comprehensive strategic plans for liberation are rarely if ever developed dictatorships appear much more durable than they in fact are they survive for years or decades longer than need be the case section six point three four important terms in strategic planning in order to help us to think strategically clarity about the meanings of four basic terms is important grand strategy is the conception that serves to coordinate and direct the use of all appropriate and available resources economic human moral political organizational etc of a group seeking to attain its objectives in a conflict grand strategy by focusing primary attention on the group's objectives and resources in the conflict determines the most appropriate technique of action such as conventional military warfare or nonviolent struggle to be employed in the conflict in planning a grand strategy resistance leaders must evaluate and plan which pressures and influences are to be brought to bear upon the opponents further grand strategy will include decisions on the appropriate conditions and timing under which initial and subsequent resistance campaigns will be launched grand strategy sets the basic framework for the selection of more limited strategies for waging the struggle grand strategy also determines the allocation of general tasks to particular groups and the distribution of resources to them for use in the struggle strategy 
is the conception of how best to achieve particular objectives in a conflict operating within the scope of the chosen grand strategy strategy is concerned with whether when and how to fight as well as how to achieve maximum effectiveness in struggling for certain ends a strategy has been compared to the artist's concept while a strategic plan is the architect's blueprint strategy may also include efforts to develop a strategic situation that is so advantageous that the opponents are able to foresee that open conflict is likely to bring their certain defeat and therefore capitulate without an open struggle or if not the improved strategic situation will make success of the challenges certain in struggle strategy also involves how to act to make good use of successes when gained applied to the course of the struggle itself the strategic plan is the basic idea of how a campaign shall develop and how its separate components shall be fitted together to contribute most advantageously to achieve its objectives it involves the skillful deployment of particular action groups and smaller operations planning for a wise strategy must take into consideration the requirements for success in the operation of the chosen technique of struggle different techniques will have different requirements of course just fulfilling requirements is not sufficient to ensure success additional factors may also be needed in devising strategies the democrats must clearly define their objectives and determine how to measure the effectiveness of efforts to achieve them this definition and analysis permits the strategist to identify the precise requirements for securing each selected objective this need for clarity and definition applies equally to tactical planning tactics and methods of action are used to implement the strategy tactics relate to the skillful use of one's forces to the best advantage in a limited situation a tactic is a limited action employed to achieve a restricted objective the choice of tactics is governed by the conception of how best in a restricted phase of a conflict to utilize the available means of fighting to implement the strategy to be most effective tactics and methods must be chosen and applied with constant attention to the achievement of strategic objectives tactical gains that do not reinforce the attainment of strategic objectives may in the end turn out to be wasted energy a tactic is thus concerned with a limited course of action that fits within the broad strategy just as a strategy fits within the grand strategy tactics are always concerned with fighting whereas strategy includes wider considerations a particular tactic can only be understood as part of the overall strategy of a battle or a campaign tactics are applied for shorter periods of time than strategies or in smaller areas geographical institutional etc or by a more limited number of people or for more limited objectives in non-violent action the distinction between a tactical objective and a strategic objective may be partly indicated by whether the chosen objective of the action is minor or major offensive tactical engagements are selected to support attainment of strategic objectives tactical engagements are the tools the strategist in creating conditions favorable for delivering decisive attacks against an opponent it is most important therefore that those given responsibility for planning and executing tactical operations be skilled in assessing the situation and selecting the most appropriate methods for it those expected to participate must be trained in the use of the chosen technique and the specific methods method refers to the specific weapons or means of action within the technique of nonviolent struggle these include the dozens of particular forms of action such as the many kinds of strikes boycotts political non-cooperation and the like cited in chapter five see also appendix the development of a responsible and effective strategic plan for a nonviolent struggle depends upon the careful formulation and selection of the grand strategy strategies tactics and methods the main lesson of this discussion is that a calculated use of one's intellect is required in careful strategic planning for liberation from a dictatorship failure to plan intelligently can contribute to disasters while the effective use of one's intellectual capabilities 
can chart a strategic course that will judiciously utilize one's available resources to move the society towards the goal of liberty and democracy. End of chapter 6 Recording by Benjamin Gittens Chapter 7 of From Dictatorship to Democracy, 4th United States Edition, 2010, Narrated Faster Version. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Dictatorship to Democracy by Gene Sharp. Chapter 7 Planning Strategy. In order to increase the chances for success, Resistance leaders will need to formulate a comprehensive plan of action capable of strengthening the suffering people, weakening and then destroying the dictatorship, and building a durable democracy. To achieve such a plan of action, a careful assessment of the situation and of the options for effective action is needed. Out of such a careful analysis, both a grand strategy and the specific campaign strategies for achieving freedom can be developed. Though related, the development of grand strategy and campaign strategies are two separate processes. Only after the grand strategy has been developed can the specific campaign strategies be fully developed. Campaign strategies will need to be designed to achieve and reinforce the grand strategic objectives. The development of resistance strategy requires attention to many questions and tasks. Here we shall identify some of the important factors that need to be considered both at the grand strategic level and the level of campaign strategy. All strategic planning, however, requires that the resistance planners have a profound understanding of the entire conflict situation, including attention to physical, historical, governmental, military, cultural, social, political, psychological, economic, and international factors. Strategies can only be developed in the context of the particular struggle and its background. Of primary importance, democratic leaders and strategic planners will want to assess the objectives and importance of the cause. Are the objectives worth a major struggle and why? It is critical to determine the real objective of the struggle. We have argued here that overthrow of the dictatorship or removal of the present dictators is not enough. The objective in these conflicts needs to be the establishment of a free society with a democratic system of government. Clarity on this point will influence the development of a grand strategy and of the ensuing specific strategies. Particularly, strategists will need to answer many fundamental questions such as these. What are the main obstacles to achieving freedom? What factors will facilitate achieving freedom? What are the main strengths of the dictatorship? What are the various weaknesses of the dictatorship? To what degrees are the sources of power for the dictatorship vulnerable? What are the strengths of the democratic forces and the general population? What are the weaknesses of the democratic forces and how can they be corrected? What is the status of third parties, not immediately involved in the conflict, who already assist or might assist either the dictatorship or the democratic movement, and if so, in what ways? Section 7.1 Choice of Means At the grand strategic level, planners will need to choose the main means of struggle to be employed in the coming conflict. The merits and limitations of several alternative techniques of struggle will need to be evaluated, such as conventional military warfare, guerrilla warfare, political defiance, and others. In making this choice, the strategists will need to consider such questions as the following. Is the chosen type of struggle within the capacities of the Democrats? Does the chosen technique utilize strengths of the dominated population? Does this technique target the weaknesses of the dictatorship, or does it strike at its strongest points? Do the means help the Democrats become more self-reliant, or do they require dependency on third parties or external suppliers? What is the record of the use of the chosen means in bringing down dictatorships? Do they 
increase or limit the casualties and destruction that may be incurred in the coming conflict. Assuming success in ending the dictatorship, what effect would the selected means have on the type of government that would arise from the struggle? The types of action determined to be counterproductive will need to be excluded in the developed grand strategy. In previous chapters we have argued that political defiance offers significant comparative advantages to other techniques of struggle. Strategists will need to examine their particular conflict situation and determine whether political defiance provides affirmative answers to the above questions. Section 7.2 Planning for Democracy It should be remembered that against a dictatorship the objective of the grand strategy is not simply to bring down the dictators but to install a democratic system and make the rise of a new dictatorship impossible. To accomplish these objectives, the chosen means of struggle will need to contribute to a change in the distribution of effective power in the society. Under the dictatorship, the population and civil institutions of the society have been too weak, and the government too strong. Without a change in this imbalance, a new set of rulers can, if they wish, be just as dictatorial as the old ones. A palace revolution or a coup d'etat, therefore, is not welcome. Political defiance contributes to a more equitable distribution of effective power through the mobilization of the society against the dictatorship, as was discussed in Chapter 5. This process occurs in several ways. The development of a non-violent struggle capacity means that the dictatorship's capacity for violent repression no longer as easily produces intimidation and submission among the population. The population will have at its disposal powerful means to counter and at times block the exertion of the dictator's power. Further, the mobilization of popular power through political defiance will strengthen the independent institutions of the society. The experience of once exercising effective power is not quickly forgot. The knowledge and skill gained in struggle will make the population less likely to be easily dominated by would-be dictators. This shift in power relationships would ultimately make establishment of a durable democratic society much more likely. Section 7.3 External Assistance As part of the preparation of a grand strategy, it is necessary to assess what will be the relative roles of internal resistance and external pressures for disintegrating the dictatorship. In this analysis we have argued that the main force of the struggle must be borne from inside the country itself. To the degree that international assistance comes at all, it will be stimulated by the internal struggle. As a modest supplement, efforts can be made to mobilize world public opinion against the dictatorship on humanitarian, moral, and religious grounds. Efforts can be taken to obtain diplomatic, political, and economic sanctions by governments and international organizations against the dictatorship. These may take the forms of economic and military weapons embargoes, reduction in levels of diplomatic recognition, or the breaking of diplomatic ties, banning of economic assistance and prohibition of investments in the dictatorial country expulsion of the dictatorial government from various international organizations and from united nations bodies further international assistance such as the provision of financial and communications support can also be provided directly to the democratic forces section seven point four formulating a grand strategy Following an assessment of the situation, the choice of means, and a determination of the role of external assistance, planners of the grand strategy will need to sketch in broad strokes how the conflict might best be conducted. This broad plan would stretch from the present to the future liberation and the institution of a democratic system. In formulating a grand strategy, these planners will need to ask themselves a variety of questions. The following questions pose, in a more specific way than earlier, the types of considerations required in devising a grand strategy for a political defiance struggle. How might the long-term struggle best begin? 
how can the oppressed population muster sufficient self-confidence and strength to act to challenge the dictatorship even initially in a limited way how could the population's capacity to apply non-cooperation and defiance be increased with time and experience what might be the objectives of a series of limited campaigns to regain democratic control over the society and limit the dictatorship are there independent institutions that have survived the dictatorship which might be used in the struggle to establish freedom what institutions of the society can be regained from the dictator's control or what institutions need to be newly created by the democrats to meet their needs and establish spheres of democracy even while the dictatorship continues how can organizational strength and the resistance be developed how can participants be trained what resources finances equipment etc will be required throughout the struggle what types of symbolism can be most effective in mobilizing the population by what kinds of action and in what stages could the sources of power of the dictators be incrementally weakened and severed how can the resisting population simultaneously persist in its defiance and also maintain the necessary nonviolent discipline how can the society continue to meet its basic needs during the course of the struggle how can social order be maintained in the midst of a conflict as victory approaches how can the democratic resistance continue to build the institutional base of the post dictatorship society to make the transition as smooth as possible it must be remembered that no single blueprint exists or can be created to plan strategy for every liberation movement against dictatorships each struggle to bring down a dictatorship and establish a democratic system will be somewhat different no two situations will be exactly alike each dictatorship will have some individual characteristics and the capacities of the freedom-seeking population will vary planners of grand strategy for a political defiance struggle will require a profound understanding not only of their specific conflict situation but of their chosen means of struggle as well when the grand strategy of the struggle has been carefully planned there are sound reasons for making it widely known the large numbers of people required to participate may be more willing and able to act if they understand the general conception as well as specific instructions this knowledge could potentially have a very positive effect on their morale their willingness to participate and to act appropriately the general outlines of the grand strategy would become known to the dictators in any case and knowledge of its features potentially could lead them to be less brutal in their repression knowing that it could rebound politically against themselves awareness of the special characteristics of the grand strategy could potentially also contribute to dissension and defections from the dictator's own camp once a grand strategic plan for bringing down the dictatorship and establishing a democratic system has been adopted it is important for the pro-democracy groups to persist in applying it only in very rare circumstances should the struggle depart from the initial grand strategy when there is abundant evidence that the chosen grand strategy was misconceived or that the circumstances of the struggle have fundamentally changed planners may need to alter the grand strategy even then this should be done only after a basic reassessment has been made and a new more adequate grand strategic plan has been developed and adopted section seven point five planning campaign strategies however wise and promising the developed grand strategy to end the dictatorship and to institute democracy may be a grand strategy does not implement itself particular strategies will need to be developed to guide the major campaigns aimed at undermining the dictator's power these strategies in turn will incorporate and guide a range of tactical engagements that will aim to strike decisive blows against the dictator's regime the tactics and the specific methods of action must be chosen carefully so that they contribute to achieving the goals of each particular strategy the discussion here focuses exclusively on the level of strategy 
strategists planning the major campaigns will like those who planned the grand strategy require a thorough understanding of the nature and modes of operation of their chosen technique of struggle just as military officers must understand force structures tactics logistics munitions the effect of geography and the like in order to plot military strategy political defiance planners must understand the nature and strategic principles of nonviolent struggle even then however knowledge of nonviolent struggle attention to recommendations in this essay and answers to the questions posed here will not themselves produce strategies the formulation of strategies for the struggle still requires an informed creativity in planning the strategies for the specific selective resistance campaigns and for the longer term development of the liberation struggle the political defiance strategists will need to consider various issues and problems the following are among these point one determination of the specific objectives of the campaign and their contributions to implementing the grand strategy point two consideration of the specific methods or political weapons that can best be used to implement the chosen strategies within each overall plan for a particular strategic campaign it will be necessary to determine what smaller tactical plans and which specific methods of action should be used to impose pressures and restrictions against the dictatorship's sources of power it should be remembered that the achievement of major objectives will come as a result of carefully chosen and implemented specific smaller steps point three determination whether or how economic issues should be related to the overall essentially political struggle if economic issues are to be prominent in the struggle care will be needed that the economic grievances can actually be remedied after the dictatorship is ended otherwise disillusionment and disaffection may set in if quick solutions are not provided during the transition period to a democratic society such disillusionment could facilitate the rise of dictatorial forces promising an end to economic woes point four determination in advance of what kind of leadership structure and communication system will work best for initiating the resistance struggle what means of decision making and communication will be possible during the course of the struggle to give continuing guidance to the resistors and the general population point five communication of the resistance news to the general population to the dictators forces and the international press claims and reporting should always be strictly factual exaggerations and unfounded claims will undermine the credibility of the resistance point six plans for self-reliant constructive social educational economic and political activities to meet the needs of one's own people during the common conflict such projects can be conducted by persons not directly involved in the resistance activities point seven determination of what kind of external assistance is desirable in support of the specific campaign or the general liberation struggle how can external help be best mobilized and used without making the internal struggle dependent on uncertain external factors attention will need to be given to which external groups are most likely and most appropriate to assist such as non-governmental organizations social movements religious or political groups labor unions etc governments and or the united nations and its various bodies furthermore the resistance planners will need to take measures to preserve order and to meet social needs by one's own forces during mass resistance against dictatorial controls this will not only create alternative independent democratic structures and meet genuine needs but also will reduce credibility for any claims that ruthless repression is required to halt disorder and lawlessness section seven point six spreading the idea of non-cooperation for successful political defiance against a dictatorship it is essential that the population grasp the idea of non-cooperation as illustrated by the monkey master story see chapter three the basic idea is simple 
if enough of the subordinates refuse to continue their cooperation long enough despite repression the oppressive system will be weakened and finally collapse people living under the dictatorship may be already familiar with this concept from a variety of sources even so the democratic forces should deliberately spread and popularize the idea of non-cooperation the monkey master story or a similar one could be disseminated throughout the society such a story could be easily understood once the general concept of non-cooperation is grasped people will be able to understand the relevance of future calls to practice non-cooperation with the dictatorship they will also be able on their own to improvise a myriad of specific forms of non-cooperation in new situations despite the difficulties and dangers in attempts to communicate ideas news and resistance instructions while living under dictatorships democrats have frequently proved this to be possible even under nazi and communist rule it was possible for resistors to communicate not only with other individuals but even with large public audiences through the production of illegal newspapers leaflets books and in later years with audio and video cassettes with the advantage of prior strategic planning general guidelines for resistance can be prepared and disseminated these can indicate the issues and circumstances under which the population should protest and withhold cooperation and how this might be done then even if communications from the democratic leadership are severed and specific instructions have not been issued or received the population will know how to act on certain important issues such guidelines would also provide a test to identify counterfeit resistance instructions issued by the political police designed to provoke discrediting action section seven point seven repression and countermeasures strategic planners will need to assess the likely responses and repression especially the threshold of violence of the dictatorship to the actions of the democratic resistance it will be necessary to determine how to withstand counteract or avoid this possible increased repression without submission tactically for specific occasions appropriate warnings to the population and the resistors about expected repression would be in order so that they will know the risks of participation if repression may be serious preparations for medical assistance for wounded resistors should be made anticipating repression the strategists will do well to consider in advance the use of tactics and methods that will contribute to achieving the specific goal of a campaign or liberation but that will make brutal repression less likely or less possible for example street demonstrations and parades against extreme dictatorships may be dramatic but they may also risk thousands of dead demonstrators the high cost to the demonstrators may not however actually apply more pressure on the dictatorship than would occur through everyone staying home a strike or massive acts of non-cooperation from the civil servants if it has been proposed that provocative resistance action risking high casualties will be required for a strategic purpose then one should very carefully consider the proposal's costs and possible gains will the population and the resistors be likely to behave in a disciplined and non-violent manner during the course of the struggle can they resist provocations to violence planners must consider what measures may be taken to keep non-violent discipline and maintain the resistance despite brutalities will such measures as pledges policy statements discipline leaflets marshals for demonstrations and boycotts of pro-violence persons and groups be possible and effective leaders should always be alert for the presence of agents provocateurs whose mission will be to incite the demonstrators to violence section seven point eight adhering to the strategic plan once a sound strategic plan is in place the democratic forces should not be distracted by minor moves of the dictators that may tempt them to depart from the grand strategy and the strategy for a particular campaign causing them to focus major activities on unimportant issues 
nor should the emotions of the moment, perhaps in response to new brutalities by the dictatorship, be allowed to divert the democratic resistance from its grand strategy or the campaign strategy. The brutalities may have been perpetrated precisely in order to provoke the democratic forces to abandon their well-laid plan, and even to commit violent acts, in order that the dictators could more easily defeat them. As long as the basic analysis is judged to be sound, the task of the pro-democracy forces is to press forward, stage by stage. Of course, changes in tactics and intermediate objectives will occur, and good leaders will always be ready to exploit opportunities. These adjustments should not be confused with objectives of the grand strategy or the objectives of the specific campaign. Careful implementation of the chosen grand strategy and of strategies for particular campaigns will greatly contribute to success. End of chapter 7 Recording by Benjamin Gittens Chapter 8 of From Dictatorship to Democracy 4th United States Edition 2010 Narrated Faster Version This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Dictatorship to Democracy by Gene Sharp Chapter 8 Applying Political Defiance in situations in which the population feels powerless and frightened, it is important that initial tasks for the public be low-risk, confidence-building actions. These types of actions, such as wearing one's clothes in an unusual way, may publicly register a dissenting opinion and provide an opportunity for the public to participate significantly in acts of dissent. In other cases, a relatively minor, on the surface, non-political issue, such as securing a safe water supply, might be made the focus for group action. Strategists should choose an issue, the merits of which will be widely recognized and difficult to reject. Success in such limited campaigns could not only correct specific grievances, but also convince the population that it indeed has power potential. Most of the strategies of campaigns in the long-term struggle should not aim for the immediate, complete downfall of the dictatorship, instead for gaining limited objectives. Nor does every campaign require the participation of all sections of the population. In contemplating a series of specific campaigns to implement the grand strategy, the defiance strategists need to consider how the campaigns at the beginning, the middle, and near the conclusion of the long-term struggle will differ from each other. Section 8.1 Selective Resistance in the initial stages of the struggle, separate campaigns with different specific objectives can be very useful. Such selective campaigns may follow one after the other. Occasionally, two or three might overlap in time. In planning a strategy for selective resistance, it is necessary to identify specific limited issues or grievances that symbolize the general oppression of the dictatorship. Such issues may be the appropriate targets for conducting campaigns to gain intermediary strategic objectives within the overall grand strategy. These intermediary strategic objectives need to be attainable by the current or projected power capacity of the democratic forces. This helps to ensure a series of victories, which are good for morale, and also contribute to advantageous incremental shifts in power relations for the long-term struggle. Selective resistance strategies should concentrate primarily on specific social, economic, or political issues. These may be chosen in order to keep some part of the social and political system out of the dictator's control, to regain control of some part currently controlled by the dictators, or to deny the dictators a particular objective. If possible, the campaign of selective resistance should also strike at one weakness or more of the dictatorship, as already discussed. Thereby, Democrats can make the greatest possible impact with their available power capacity. Very early, the strategists need to plan at least the strategy for the first campaign. What are to be its limited objectives? How will it help fulfill the chosen grand strategy? 
if possible, it is wise to formulate at least the general outlines of strategies for a second and possibly a third campaign. All such strategies will need to implement the chosen grand strategy and operate within its general guidelines. Section 8.2 Symbolic Challenge At the beginning of a new campaign to undermine the dictatorship, the first, more specifically political actions may be limited in scope. They should be designed in part to test and influence the mood of the population and to prepare them for continuing struggle through non-cooperation and political defiance. The initial action is likely to take the form of symbolic protest or may be a symbolic act of limited or temporary non-cooperation. If the number of persons willing to act is small, then the initial act might, for example, involve placing flowers at a place of symbolic importance. On the other hand, if the number of persons willing to act is very large, then a five-minute halt to all activities, or several minutes of silence, might be used. In other situations, a few individuals might undertake a hunger strike, a vigil at a place of symbolic importance, a brief student boycott of classes, or a temporary sit-in at an important office. Under a dictatorship, these more aggressive actions would most likely be met with harsh repression. Certain symbolic acts, such as a physical occupation in front of the dictator's palace or political police headquarters, may involve high risk and are therefore not advisable for initiating a campaign. Initial symbolic protest actions have at times aroused major national and international attention. As the mass street demonstrations in Burma in 1988, or the student occupation and hunger strike in Tiananmen Square in Beijing in 1989. The high casualties of demonstrators in both of these cases points to the great care strategists must exercise in planning campaigns. Although having a tremendous moral and psychological impact, such actions by themselves are unlikely to bring down a dictatorship, for they remain largely symbolic and do not alter the power position of the dictatorship. It usually is not possible to sever the availability of the sources of power to the dictators completely and rapidly at the beginning of a struggle. That would require virtually the whole population and almost all the institutions of the society which had previously been largely submissive, to reject absolutely the regime and suddenly defy it by massive and strong non-cooperation. That has not yet occurred and would be most difficult to achieve. In most cases, therefore, a quick campaign of full non-cooperation and defiance is an unrealistic strategy for an early campaign against the dictatorship. Section 8.3 spreading responsibility. During a selective resistance campaign, the brunt of the struggle is for a time usually borne by one section or more of the population. In a later campaign with a different objective, the burden of the struggle would be shifted to other population groups. For example, students might conduct strikes on an educational issue. Religious leaders and believers might concentrate on a freedom of religion issue. Rail workers might meticulously obey safety regulations so as to slow down the rail transport system. Journalists might challenge censorship by publishing papers with blank spaces in which prohibited articles would have appeared. Or police might repeatedly fail to locate and arrest wanted members of the democratic opposition. Phasing resistance campaigns by issue and population group will allow certain segments of the population to rest while resistance continues. Selective resistance is especially important to defend the existence and autonomy of independent social, economic and political groups and institutions outside the control of the dictatorship, which were briefly discussed earlier. These centers of power provide the institutional bases from which the population can exert pressure or can resist dictatorial controls. In the struggle, they are likely to be among the first targets of the dictatorship. Section 8.4 Aiming at the Dictator's Power As the long-term struggle develops beyond the initial strategies into more ambitious and advanced phases, 
the strategists will need to calculate how the dictator's sources of power can be further restricted. The aim would be to use popular non-cooperation to create a new, more advantageous strategic situation for the democratic forces. As the democratic resistance forces gained strength, strategists would plot more ambitious non-cooperation and defiance to sever the dictatorship's sources of power, with the goal of producing increasing political paralysis and, in the end, the disintegration of the dictatorship itself. It will be necessary to plan carefully how the democratic forces can weaken the support the people and groups have previously offered to the dictatorship. Will their support be weakened by revelations of the brutalities perpetrated by the regime, by exposure of the disastrous economic consequences of the dictator's policies, or by a new understanding that the dictatorship can be ended? The dictator's supporters should at least be induced to become neutral in their activities, fence-sitters, or preferably to become active supporters of the movement for democracy. During the planning and implementation of political defiance and non-cooperation, it is highly important to pay close attention to all of the dictator's main supporters and aides, including the inner clique, political party, police and bureaucrats, but especially their army. The degree of loyalty of the military forces, both soldiers and officers, to the dictatorship needs to be carefully assessed and a determination should be made as to whether the military is open to influence by the democratic forces. Might many of the ordinary soldiers be unhappy and frightened conscripts? Might many of the soldiers and officers be alienated from the regime for personal, family or political reasons? What other factors might make soldiers and officers vulnerable to democratic subversion? Early in the liberation struggle, a special strategy should be developed to communicate with the dictator's troops and functionaries. By words, symbols and actions, the democratic forces can inform the troops that the liberation struggle will be vigorous, determined and persistent. Troops should learn that the struggle will be of a special character, designed to undermine the dictatorship but not to threaten their lives. Such efforts would aim ultimately to undermine the morale of the dictator's troops and finally to subvert their loyalty and obedience in favour of the democratic movement. Similar strategies could be aimed at the police and civil servants. The attempt to garner sympathy from and eventually induce disobedience among the dictator's forces ought not to be interpreted, however, to mean encouragement of the military forces to make a quick end to the current dictatorship through military action. Such a scenario is not likely to install a working democracy, for, as we have discussed, a coup d'etat does little to redress the imbalance of power relations between the populace and the rulers. Therefore, it will be necessary to plan how sympathetic military officers can be brought to understand that neither a military coup nor a civil war against the dictatorship is required or desirable. Sympathetic officers can play vital roles in the democratic struggle, such as spreading disaffection and non-cooperation in the military forces, encouraging deliberate inefficiencies and the quiet ignoring of orders, and supporting the refusal to carry out repression. Military personnel may also offer various modes of positive, non-violent assistance to the democracy movement, including safe passage, information, food, medical supplies and the like. The army is one of the most important sources of the power of dictators because it can use its disciplined military units and weaponry directly to attack and to punish the disobedient population. Defiant strategists should remember that it will be exceptionally difficult or impossible to disintegrate the dictatorship if the police, bureaucrats and military forces remain fully supportive of the dictatorship and obedient in carrying out its commands. Strategies aimed at subverting the loyalty of the dictator's forces should therefore be given a high priority by democratic strategists. The democratic forces should remember that disaffection and disobedience among the military forces and police can be highly dangerous for the members of those groups. 
soldiers and police could expect severe penalties for any act of disobedience, and execution for acts of mutiny. The democratic forces should not ask the soldiers and officers that they immediately mutiny. Instead, where communication is possible, it should be made clear that there are a multitude of relatively safe forms of disguised disobedience that they can take initially. For example, police and troops can carry out instructions for repression inefficiently, fail to locate wanted persons, warn resistors of impending repression, arrests or deportations, and fail to report important information to their superior officers. Disaffected officers in turn can neglect to relay commands for repression down the chain of command. Soldiers may shoot over the heads of demonstrators. Similarly, for their part, civil servants can lose files and instructions, work inefficiently and become ill so that they need to stay home until they recover. Section 8.5 Shifts in Strategy the political defiance strategists will need constantly to assess how the grand strategy and the specific campaign strategies are being implemented. It is possible, for example, that the struggle may not go as well as expected. In that case, it will be necessary to calculate what shifts in strategy might be required, what can be done to increase the movement's strength and regain the initiative. In such a situation, it will be necessary to identify the problem make a strategic reassessment, possibly shift struggle responsibilities to a different population group, mobilize additional sources of power, and develop alternative courses of action. When that is done, the new plan should be implemented immediately. Conversely, if the struggle has gone much better than expected and the dictatorship is collapsing earlier than previously calculated, how can the democratic forces capitalize on unexpected gains and move towards paralyzing the dictatorship? We will explore this question in the following chapter. End of chapter 8 Recording by Benjamin Giddens Chapter 9 of From Dictatorship to Democracy 4th United States Edition 2010 Narrated Faster Version This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Dictatorship to Democracy by Jean Sharp Chapter 9. Disintegrating the Dictatorship The cumulative effect of well-conducted and successful political defiance campaigns is to strengthen the resistance and to establish and expand areas of the society where the dictatorship faces limits on its effective control. These campaigns also provide important experience in how to refuse cooperation and how to offer political defiance. That experience will be of great assistance when the time comes for non-cooperation and defiance on a mass scale. As was discussed in Chapter 3, obedience, cooperation and submission are essential if dictators are to be powerful. Without access to the sources of political power, the dictator's power weakens and finally dissolves. Withdrawal of support is therefore the major required action to disintegrate a dictatorship. It may be useful to review how the sources of power can be affected by political defiance. Acts of symbolic repudiation and defiance are among the available means to undermine the regime's moral and political authority, its legitimacy. The greater the regime's authority, the greater and more reliable is the obedience and cooperation which it will receive. Moral disapproval needs to be expressed in action in order to seriously threaten the existence of the dictatorship. Withdrawal of cooperation and obedience are needed to sever the availability of other sources of the regime's power. A second important such source of power is human resources. The number and importance of the persons and groups that obey, cooperate with, or assist the rulers. If non-cooperation is practiced by large parts of the population, the regime will be in serious trouble. For example, 
if the civil servants no longer function with their normal efficiency or even stay at home the administrative apparatus will be gravely affected similarly if the non-cooperating persons and groups include those that have previously supplied specialized skills and knowledge then the dictators will see their capacity to implement their will gravely weakened even their ability to make well-informed decisions and develop effective policies may be seriously reduced if psychological and ideological influences called intangible factors that usually induce people to obey and assist the rules are weakened or reversed the population will be more inclined to disobey and to non-cooperate the dictator's access to material resources also directly affects their power with control of financial resources the economic system property natural resources transportation and means of communications in the hands of actual or potential opponents of the regime another major source of their power is vulnerable or removed strikes boycotts and increasing autonomy in the economy communications and transportation will weaken the regime as previously discussed the dictator's ability to threaten or apply sanctions punishments against the restive disobedient and uh, non-cooperative sections of the population is a central source of the power of dictators this source of power can be weakened in two ways first if the population is prepared as in a war to risk serious consequences as the price of defiance the effectiveness of the available sanctions will be drastically reduced that is the dictator's repression will not secure the desired submission second if the police and the military forces themselves become disaffected they may on an individual or mass basis evade or outright defy orders to arrest beat or shoot resistors if the dictators can no longer rely on the police and military forces to carry out repression the dictatorship is gravely threatened in summary success against an entrenched dictatorship requires that non-cooperation and defiance reduce and remove the sources of the regime's power without constant replenishment of the necessary sources of power the dictatorship will weaken and finally disintegrate competent strategic planning of political defiance against dictatorships therefore needs to target the dictator's most important sources of power section nine point one escalating freedom combined with political defiance during the phase of selective resistance the growth of autonomous social economic cultural and political institutions progressively expands the democratic space of the society and shrinks the control of the dictatorship as the civil institutions of the society become stronger via v the dictatorship then whatever the dictators may wish the population is incrementally building an independent society outside of their control if and when the dictatorship intervenes to halt this escalating freedom non-violent struggle can be applied in defense of this newly won space and the dictatorship will be faced with yet another front in the struggle in time this combination of resistance and institution building can lead to de facto freedom making the collapse of the dictatorship and the formal installation of a democratic system undeniable because the power relationships within the society have been fundamentally altered poland in the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties provides a clear example of the progressive reclaiming of a society's functions and institutions by the resistance the catholic church had been persecuted but never brought under full communist control in 1976 certain intellectuals and workers formed small groups such as kor workers defense committee to advance their political ideas the organization of the solidarity trade union with its power to wield effective strikes forced its own legalization in 1980 peasants students and many other groups also formed their own independent organizations when the communists realized that these groups had changed the power realities solidarity was again banned and the communists resorted to military rule 
even under martial law with many imprisonments and harsh persecution the new independent institutions of the society continued to function for example dozens of illegal newspapers and magazines continued to be published illegal publishing houses annually issued hundreds of books while well-known writers boycotted communist publications and government publishing houses similar activities continued in other parts of the society under the jaruzelski military regime the military communist government was at one point described as bouncing around on the top of the society the officials still occupied government offices and buildings the regime could still strike down into the society with punishments arrests imprisonment seizures of printing presses and the like the dictatorship however could not control the society from that point it was only a matter of time until the society was able to bring down the regime completely even while a dictatorship still occupies government positions it is sometimes possible to organize a democratic parallel government this would increasingly operate as a rival government to which loyalty compliance and cooperation are given by the population and the society's institutions the dictatorship would then consequently on an increasing basis be deprived of these characteristics of government eventually the democratic parallel government may fully replace the dictatorial regime as part of the transition to a democratic system in due course then a constitution would be adopted and elections held as part of the transition section nine point two disintegrating the dictatorship while the institutional transformation of the society is taking place the defiance and non-cooperation movement may escalate strategists of the democratic forces should contemplate early that there will come a time when the democratic forces can move beyond selective resistance and launch mass defiance in most cases time will be required for creating building or expanding resistance capacities and the development of mass defiance may occur only after several years during this interim period campaigns of selective resistance should be launched with increasingly important political objectives larger parts of the population at all levels of the society should become involved given determined and disciplined political defiance during this escalation of activities the internal weaknesses of the dictatorship are likely to become increasingly obvious the combination of strong political defiance and the building of independent institutions is likely in time to produce widespread international attention favorable to the democratic forces it may also produce international diplomatic condemnations boycotts and embargoes in support of the democratic forces as it did for poland strategists should be aware that in some situations the collapse of the dictatorship may occur extremely rapidly as in east germany in 1989 this can happen when the sources of power are massively severed as a result of the whole population's revulsion against the dictatorship this pattern is not usual however and it is better to plan for a long-term struggle but to be prepared for a short one during the course of the liberation struggle victories even on limited issues should be celebrated those who have earned the victory should be recognized celebrations with vigilance should also help to keep up the morale needed for the future stages of the struggle section nine point three handling success responsibly planners of the grand strategy should calculate in advance the possible and preferred ways in which a successful struggle might best be concluded in order to prevent the rise of a new dictatorship and to ensure the gradual establishment of a durable democratic system the democrats should calculate how the transition from the dictatorship to the interim government shall be handled at the end of the struggle it is desirable at that time to establish quickly a new functioning government however it must not be merely the old one with new personnel 
it is necessary to calculate what sections of the old governmental structure, as the political police, are to be completely abolished because of their inherent anti-democratic character, and which sections are retained to be subjected to later democratization efforts. A complete governmental void could open the way to chaos or a new dictatorship. Thought should be given in advance to determine what is to be the policy towards high officials of the dictatorship when its power disintegrates. For example, are the dictators to be brought to trial in a court? Are they to be permitted to leave the country permanently? What other options may there be that are consistent with political defiance, the need for reconstructing the country, and building a democracy following the victory? A bloodbath must be avoided which could have drastic consequences on the possibility of a future democratic system. Specific plans for the transition to democracy should be ready for application when the dictatorship is weakening or collapses. Such plans will help to prevent another group from seizing state power through a coup d'etat. Plans for the institution of democratic constitutional government with full political and personal liberties will also be required. The changes won at a great price should not be lost through lack of planning. When confronted with the increasingly empowered population and the growth of independent democratic groups and institutions, both of which the dictatorship is unable to control, the dictators will find that their whole venture is unravelling. Massive shutdowns of the society, general strikes, mass stay-at-homes, defiant marches, or other activities will increasingly undermine the dictator's own organization and related institutions. As a consequence of such defiance and non-cooperation, executed wisely and with mass participation over time, the dictators would become powerless and the democratic defenders would, without violence, triumph. The dictatorship would disintegrate before the defiant population. Not every such effort will succeed, especially not easily and rarely quickly. It should be remembered that as many military wars are lost, as are won. However, political defiance offers a real possibility of victory. As stated earlier, that possibility can be greatly increased through the development of a wise grand strategy, careful strategic planning, hard work, and disciplined, courageous struggle. End of chapter 9. Recording by Benjamin Gittens. Chapter 10 of From Dictatorship to Democracy, 4th United States Edition, 2010. Narrated faster version. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Dictatorship to Democracy by Gene Sharp. Chapter 10. Groundwork for Durable Democracy. The disintegration of the dictatorship is, of course, a cause for major celebration. People who have suffered for so long and struggled at great price merit a time of joy, relaxation and recognition. They should feel proud of themselves and of all who struggled with them to win political freedom. Not all will have lived to see this day. The living and the dead will be remembered as heroes who helped to shape the history of freedom in their country. Unfortunately, this is not a time for a reduction in vigilance. Even in the event of a successful disintegration of the dictatorship by political defiance, careful precautions must be taken to prevent the rise of a new oppressive regime out of the confusion following the collapse of the old one. The leaders of the pro-democracy forces should have prepared in advance for an orderly transition to a democracy. The dictatorial structures will need to be dismantled. The constitutional and legal bases and standards of behavior of a durable democracy will need to be built. No one should believe that with the downfall of the dictatorship, an ideal society will immediately appear. The disintegration of the dictatorship simply provides the beginning point under conditions of enhanced freedom 
for long-term efforts to improve the society and meet human needs more adequately. Serious political, economic and social problems will continue for years, requiring the cooperation of many people and groups in seeking their resolution. The new political system should provide the opportunities for people with varying outlooks and favoured measures to continue constructive work and policy development to deal with problems in the future. Section 10.1 Threats of a New Dictatorship Aristotle warned long ago that tyranny can also change into tyranny. There is ample historical evidence from France, the Jacobins and Napoleon, Russia, the Bolsheviks, Iran, the Ayatollah, Burma, S-L-O-R-C, and elsewhere, that the collapse of an oppressive regime will be seen by some persons and groups as merely the opportunity for them to step in as the new masters. Their motives may vary, but the results are often approximately the same. The new dictatorship may even be more cruel and total in its control than the old one. Even before the collapse of the dictatorship, members of the old regime may attempt to cut short the defiant struggle for democracy by staging a coup d'etat designed to preempt victory by the popular resistance. It may claim to oust the dictatorship, but in fact seek only to impose a new refurbished model of the old one. Section 10.2 Blocking Coups There are ways in which coups against newly liberated societies can be defeated. Advanced knowledge of that defence capacity may at times be sufficient to deter the attempt. Preparation can produce prevention. Immediately after a coup is started, the putschists require legitimacy, that is, acceptance of their moral and political right to rule. The first basic principle of anti-coup defence is therefore to deny legitimacy to the putschists. The putschists also require that the civilian leaders and population be supportive, confused, or just passive. The putschists require the cooperation of specialists and advisers, bureaucrats and civil servants, administrators and judges, in order to consolidate their control over the affected society. The putschists also require that the multitude of people who operate the political system, the society's institutions, the economy, the police and the military forces will passively submit and carry out their usual functions as modified by the putschists' orders and policies. The second basic principle of anti-coup defence is to resist the putschists with non-cooperation and defiance. The needed cooperation and assistance must be denied. Essentially, the same means of struggle that was used against the dictatorship can be used against the new threat, but applied immediately. If both legitimacy and cooperation are denied, the coup may die of political starvation and the chance to build a democratic society restored. Section 10.3 Constitution Drafting The new democratic system will require a constitution that establishes the desired framework of the democratic government. The constitution should set the purposes of government, limits on governmental powers, the means and timing of elections by which governmental officials and legislators will be chosen, the inherent rights of the people, and the relation of the national government to other lower levels of government. Within the central government, if it is to remain democratic, a clear division of authority should be established between the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government. Strong restrictions should be included on activities of the police, intelligence services, and military forces to prohibit any legal political interference. In the interests of preserving the democratic system and impeding dictatorial trends and measures, the Constitution should preferably be one that establishes a federal system with significant prerogatives reserved for the regional, state, and local levels of government. In some situations, the Swiss system of cantons might be considered in which relatively small areas retain major prerogatives while remaining a part of the whole country.
if a constitution with many of these features existed earlier in the newly liberated country's history it might be wise simply to restore it to operation amending it as deemed necessary and desirable if a suitable older constitution is not present it may be necessary to operate with an interim constitution otherwise a new constitution will need to be prepared preparing a new constitution will take considerable time and thought popular participation in this process is desirable and required for ratification of a new text or amendments one should be very cautious about including in the constitution promises that later might prove impossible to implement or provisions that would require a highly centralized government for both can facilitate a new dictatorship the wording of the constitution should be easily understood by the majority of the population a constitution should not be so complex or ambiguous that only lawyers or other elites can claim to understand it section ten point four a democratic defense policy the liberated country may also face foreign threats for which a defense capacity would be required the country might also be threatened by foreign attempts to establish economic political or military domination in the interests of maintaining internal democracy serious consideration should be given to applying the basic principles of political defiance to the needs of national defense by placing resistance capacity directly in the hands of the citizenry newly liberated countries could avoid the need to establish a strong military capacity which could itself threaten democracy or require vast economic resources much needed for other purposes it must be remembered that some groups will ignore any constitutional provision in their aim to establish themselves as new dictators therefore a permanent role will exist for the population to apply political defiance and non-cooperation against would-be dictators and to preserve democratic structures rights and procedures section ten point five a meritorious responsibility the effect of non-violent struggle is not only to weaken and remove the dictators but also to empower the oppressed this technique enables people who formerly felt themselves to be only pawns or victims to wield power directly in order to gain by their own efforts greater freedom and justice this experience of struggle has important psychological consequences contributing to increased self-esteem and self-confidence among the formerly powerless one important long-term beneficial consequence of the use of non-violent struggle for establishing democratic government is that the society will be more capable of dealing with continuing and future problems these might include future governmental abuse and corruption maltreatment of any group economic injustices and limitations on the democratic qualities of the political system the population experienced in the use of political defiance is less likely to be vulnerable to future dictatorships after liberation familiarity with non-violent struggle will provide ways to defend democracy civil liberties minority rights and prerogatives of regional state and local governments and non-governmental institutions such means also provide ways by which people and groups can express extreme dissent peacefully on issues seen as so important that opposition groups have sometimes resorted to terrorism or guerrilla warfare the thoughts in this examination of political defiance or non-violent struggle are intended to be helpful to all persons and groups who seek to lift dictatorial oppression from their people and to establish a durable democratic system that respects human freedoms and popular action to improve the society there are three major conclusions to the ideas sketched here liberation from dictatorships is possible very careful thought and strategic planning will be required to achieve it and vigilance hard work and discipline struggle often at great cost will be needed the oft quoted phrase freedom is not free is true no outside force is coming to give oppressed people the freedom they so much want people will have to learn how to take that freedom themselves easy it cannot be 
if people can grasp what is required for their own liberation they can chart courses of action which through much travail can eventually bring them their freedom then with diligence they can construct a new democratic order and prepare for its defence freedom won by struggle of this type can be durable it can be maintained by a tenacious people committed to its preservation and enrichment End of chapter 10 Recording by Benjamin Giddens Appendix 1 of From Dictatorship to Democracy 4th United States Edition 2010 Narrated Faster Version This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org from dictatorship to democracy by jean sharp appendix one the methods of non-violent action the methods of non-violent protest and persuasion a formal statements including public speeches letters of opposition or support declarations by organizations and institutions signed public statements declarations of indictment and intention and group or mass petitions b communications with a wider audience including slogans caricatures and symbols banners posters and displayed communications leaflets pamphlets and books newspapers and journals records radio and television sky writing and earth writing c group representations including deputations mock awards group lobbying picketing and mock elections d symbolic public acts including displays of flags and symbolic colors wearing of symbols prayer and worship delivering symbolic objects protest disrobings destruction of own property symbolic lights displays of portraits paint as protest new signs and names symbolic sounds symbolic reclamations and rude gestures e pressures on individuals including haunting officials taunting officials fraternization and vigils f drama and music including humorous skits and pranks performances of plays and music singing g processions including marches parades religious processions pilgrimages and motorcades h honoring the dead including political mourning mock funerals demonstrative funerals and homage at burial places i public assemblies including assemblies of protest or support protest meetings camouflaged meetings of protest and teach-ins j withdrawal and renunciation including walkouts silence renouncing honors and turning one's back the methods of social non-cooperation a ostracism of persons including social boycott selective social boycott lysistratic non-action excommunication and interdict b non-cooperation with social events customs and institutions including suspension of social and sports activities boycott of social affairs student strike 
social disobedience and withdrawal from social institutions c withdrawal from the social system including stay at home total personal non-cooperation flight of workers sanctuary collective disappearance and protest emigration his rat the methods of economic non-cooperation specifically in the form of economic boycotts a actions by consumers including consumers boycott non-consumption of boycotted goods policy of austerity rent withholding refusal to rent national consumers boycott international consumers boycott b action by workers and producers including workmen's boycott and producers boycott c action by middlemen suppliers and handlers boycott d action by owners and management including traders boycott refusal to let or sell property lockout refusal of industrial assistance and merchants general strike e action by holders of financial resources including withdrawal of bank deposits refusal to pay fees dues and assessments refusal to pay debts or interest severance of funds and credit revenue refusal and refusal of government's money f action by governments including domestic embargo blacklisting of traders international sellers embargo international buyers embargo and international trade embargo the methods of economic non-cooperation specifically the strike a symbolic strikes including protest strike and quickie walkout as in lightning strike b agricultural strikes including peasant strike and farm workers strike c strikes by special groups including refusal of impressed labor prisoners strike craft strike and professional strike d ordinary industrial strikes including establishment strike industry strike and sympathetic strike e restricted strikes including detailed strike bumper strike slow down strike working to rule strike reporting sick as in sick in strike by resignation limited strike and selective strike f multi-industry strikes including generalized strike and general strike g combination of strikes and economic closures including hartel and economic shutdown the methods of political non-cooperation a rejection of authority including withholding or withdrawal of allegiance refusal of public support and literature and speeches advocating resistance b citizens non-cooperation with government including boycott of legislative bodies boycott of elections boycott of government employment and positions boycott of government departments agencies and other bodies withdrawal from government educational institutions boycott of government supported organizations refusal of assistance to enforcement agents removal 
of own signs and place marks, refusal to accept appointed officials, and refusal to dissolve existing institutions. C. Citizens' alternatives to obedience, including reluctant and slow compliance. Non-obedience in absence of direct supervision. Popular non-obedience. Disguised disobedience. Refusal of assemblage or meeting to disperse. Sit down. Non-cooperation with conscription and deportation. Hiding, escape and false identities. And civil disobedience of illegitimate laws. D. Action by government personnel, including selective refusal of assistance by government aides, blocking of lines of command and information, stalling and obstruction, general administrative non cooperation, judicial non cooperation, deliberate inefficiency and selective non cooperation by enforcement agents, and mutiny. E. Domestic governmental action, including quasi-legal evasions and delays, and non-cooperation by constituent governmental units. F. International governmental action, including changes in diplomatic and other representation, delay and cancellation of diplomatic events withholding of diplomatic recognition, severance of diplomatic relations, withdrawal from international organizations, refusal of membership in international bodies, and expulsion from international organizations. The Methods of Nonviolent Intervention A. Psychological Intervention, including self-exposure to the elements, the fast being a fast of moral pressure, or a hunger strike, or a satyagraphic fast, reverse trial, and non-violent harassment. B. Physical intervention, including sit-in, stand-in, ride-in, wade-in, mill-in, Pray in, nonviolent raids, nonviolent air raids, nonviolent invasion, nonviolent interjection, nonviolent obstruction, and nonviolent occupation. C. Social intervention, including establishing new social patterns, overloading of facilities, stall in, speak in, guerrilla theatre, alternative social institutions, and alternative communication system. D. Economic intervention, including reverse strike, stay-in strike, non-violent land seizure, defiance of blockades, politically motivated counterfeiting, preclusive purchasing, seizure of assets, dumping, selective patronage, alternative markets, alternative transportation systems, and alternative economic institutions. E. Political intervention, including overloading of administrative systems, disclosing identities of secret agents, seeking imprisonment, civil disobedience of neutral laws work on without collaboration, and dual sovereignty and parallel government. End of Appendix 1 Read by Benjamin Gittens Appendix 2 of From Dictatorship to Democracy, 4th United States Edition, 2010 Narrated Faster Version this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
from dictatorship to democracy by jean sharp appendix two acknowledgments and notes on the history of from dictatorship to democracy i have incurred several debts of gratitude while writing the original edition of this essay bruce jenkins my special assistant in nineteen ninety three made an inestimable contribution by his identification of problems in content and presentation he also made incisive recommendations for more rigorous and clearer presentations of difficult ideas especially concerning strategy structural reorganization and editorial improvements i am also grateful for the editorial assistance of stephen cody dr christopher krugler and robert helvey offered very important criticisms and advice dr hazel mcpherson and dr patricia parkman provided information on struggles in africa and latin america respectively however the analysis and conclusions contained therein are solely my responsibility in recent years special guidelines for translations have been developed primarily due to jamila rakib's guidance and to the lessons learned from earlier years this has been necessary in order to ensure accuracy in languages in which there has earlier been no established clear terminology for this field from dictatorship to democracy was written at the request of the late yu tin mung win a prominent exile burmese democrat who was then editor of kit piang the new era journal the preparation of this text was based on over forty years of research and writing on nonviolent struggle dictatorships totalitarian systems resistance movements political theory sociological analysis and other fields i could not write an analysis that had a focus only on burma as i did not know burma well therefore i had to write a generic analysis the essay was originally published in installments in kit piang in Burmese and in English in Bangkok, Thailand in nineteen ninety three. Afterwards it was issued as a booklet in both languages, nineteen ninety four, and in Burmese again, nineteen ninety six and nineteen ninety seven. The original booklet editions from Bangkok were issued with the assistance of the Committee for the Restoration of Democracy in Burma. It was circulated both surreptitiously inside Burma and among exiles and sympathizers elsewhere this analysis was intended only for use by burmese democrats and various ethnic groups in burma that wanted independence from the burman dominated central government in rangoon burmans are the dominant ethnic group in burma i did not then envisage that the generic focus would make the analysis potentially relevant in any country with an authoritarian or dictatorial government however that appears to have been the perception by people who in recent years have sought to translate and distribute it in their languages for their countries several persons have reported that it reads as though it was written for their country the s l o r c military dictatorship in rangoon wasted no time in denouncing this publication heavy attacks were made in nineteen ninety five and nineteen ninety six and reportedly continued in later years in newspapers radio and television as late as two thousand and five persons were sentenced to seven-year prison terms merely for being in possession of the banned publication although no efforts were made to promote the publication for use in other countries translations and distribution of the publication began to spread on their own a copy of the english language book edition was seen on display in the window of a bookstore in bangkok by a student from indonesia was purchased and taken back home there it was translated into indonesian and published in nineteen ninety seven by a major indonesian publisher with an introduction by abdurrahman wahid he was then head of nad hilat al ulama the largest muslim organization in the world with thirty five million members and later president of indonesia during this time at my office at the albert einstein institution we only had a handful of photocopies from the bangkok english language booklet for a few years we had to make copies of it whenever we had inquiries for which it was relevant later marek zelaski from california took one of those copies to belgrade during milosevic's time and gave it to the organization civic initiatives they translated it into serbian and published it when we visited serbia after the collapse of the milosevic regime 
we were told that the booklet had been quite influential in the opposition movement. Also important had been the workshop on nonviolent struggle that Robert Helvey, a retired U.S. Army colonel, had given in Budapest, Hungary, for about 20 Serbian young people on the nature and potential of nonviolent struggle. Helvey also gave them copies of the complete The Politics of Nonviolent Action. These were the people who became the opto organization that led the nonviolent struggle that brought down Milosevic. We usually do not know how awareness of this publication has spread from country to country. Its availability on our website in recent years has been important, but clearly that is not the only factor. Tracing these connections would be a major research project. From dictatorship to democracy is a heavy analysis and is not easy reading. Yet, it has been deemed to be important enough for at least 28 translations, as of January 2008, to be prepared, although they required major work and expense. Translations of this publication in print or on a website include the following languages, Amharic, Ethiopia, Arabic, Aziri, Azerbaijan, Bahasa, Indonesia, Belarusian, Burmese, Chin, Burma, Chinese, simplified and traditional Mandarin, Divya, Maldives, Farsi, Iran, French, Georgian, German, Jingpo, Burma, Karen, Burma, Khmer, Cambodia, Kyrgyz, Kyrgyzstan, Nepali, Pashto, Afghanistan and Pakistan, Russian, Serbian, Spanish, Tibetan, Tigrinya, Eritrea, Ukrainian, Uzbek, Uzbekistan, and Vietnamese. Several others are in preparation. Between 1993 and 2002, there were six translations. Between 2003 and 2008, there have been 22. The great diversity of the societies and languages into which translations have spread support the provisional conclusion that the persons who initially encounter this document have seen its analysis to be relevant to their society. Jean Sharp, January 2008, Albert Einstein Institution, Boston, Massachusetts. End of Appendix 2 Recording by Benjamin Gittens End of From Dictatorship to Democracy, 4th United States Edition, by Jean Sharp